Good evening and welcome. Tonight is the second and final public hearing on the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2024 operating budget. Board members are looking forward to hearing and considering your input as we prepare to review and take action on the superintendent's recommendations. Tonight's hearing will be broadcast live on television and MCPS media, including the MCPS Spanish YouTube channel. Before we begin, let me allow board members to introduce themselves. Ms. Madrowski and Arvin Kim are not present tonight, but they are both watching online. Ms. Yang? Good evening. I'm Julie Yang, District 3. Thank you for coming tonight. Ms. Harris? Good evening, everyone. Lynn Harris. Good evening, Shepra Evans. So good to see everyone. Carla Sylvester, board president. Good afternoon. Well, good evening. <laughs> Brenda Wolf, District 5. Good evening, everyone. Grace Rivera Oven, District 1. Dr. McKnight, would you like to introduce yourself and your team? Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out this evening. Onifa McKnight, Superintendent. Turn it over to Mr. Hull for introductions. Good evening. Uh, it's great to see everyone tonight. I'm Brian Hall, Chief Operating Officer. Good evening. I'm Pat Murphy. I'm the Deputy Superintendent, and thank you for coming out this evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. I'm Dana Edwards, Chief of District Operations. Hello, Susan Marks, Acting Chief of Human Resources and Development. Good evening, Peggy Pugh, Chief Academic Officer. Stephanie Sharon, Chief of Strategic Initiatives. Good evening, Brian Stott, and Chief of Staff. Good evening, Heather Dublinsky, Executive Director in the Office of the Chief Operating Officer. Good evening, Donna Redmond Jones, Director of School Support and Wellbeing. Good evening, Rob Riley, Associate Superintendent of Finance. Good evening, Yvonne Alfonso Windsor, Supervisor of the Budget Unit. Hello, everyone. Tom Clausing, Executive Director, MCPS Office of Finance. Good evening. Stephanie Williams, General Counsel. Thank you, everyone. And I just wanted to uh, point out that the staff is here to also hear uh, your input and testimony, and they are taking uh, extensive notes. So if there's an issue that you bring up to us and we don't mention it, please rest assured that they will follow up with the responsible um, staff to follow up on what they heard tonight. The order of speakers is listed on the agenda posted on the board's website. All testimonies received before tonight's hearing have also been made available on board docs. The board's remaining operating budget work sessions will be held tomorrow, January 18th at 10 a.m. and on Tuesday, January 24th at 10 a.m. We will take tentative action on the proposed operating budget on February 23rd, 2023, during the board's regularly scheduled business meeting. I remind everyone to please stick to your uh, time slot so I don't have to interrupt you, which I do not like to do. Let's begin uh, with our first speaker. And that is from, um, our first speaker is Melot Gebrezulise. Please come forward. Just press the uh, button underneath the mic to turn it on. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Mela Gebrselase. I'm a junior at Swingbrook High School, and I'm here on behalf of the MCR Equitable Education Task Force. I am here today to urge you to allocate additional resources towards increasing the number of college and career counselors in MCPS high schools, especially those with high percentages of low income and or disadvantaged students. The current fiscal year 2024 recommended budget sets aside $37,052 in the school-based grant for a 0.6 college and career information coordinator position. I urge you to increase this number significantly, at least so it fills one additional full-year position in disadvantaged high schools. The college and career process for students starts on the first day of high school, making the opportunities and resources that school CCICs provide crucial for student success. 
However, expecting a singular CCIC to support over 1,000 students or even more in schools like Blair High School with over 4,000 students limits the reach of their work and is simply unrealistic. Our task force has had the opportunity to talk to CCICs across the county, and many feel as if the needs of students grades 9 through 12 are so diverse that it's difficult to prioritize every grade-specific needs. Investing resources into having even just one additional counselor so that one may focus on 10th and 12th graders while the other can on 9th and 11th would help best meet the needs of MCPS students, the community, and parents. My, most of the college and career programming in MCPS is so heavily focused on juniors and seniors. This change would not only allow for broader work to occur, but also for more available scheduling for students to have effective meetings from the first day of high school. In schools like mine, where many students do not have support at home, are first generation, or don't speak English, this small change will make a life-altering difference. These types of students make up the majority of my high school, yet we still only have one CCIC and lines out the door to meet with counselors. With more staff reaching out to students who may not, um, who may not even consider their future after high school until senior year, or whose only assistance in the process, such as filling out the fast fair college admissions, and more is at school, we will be setting more and more students up for success. Given, a role that, given the role that college access and completion, as well as um, career planning, play in improving opportunities for people of color, this should, be an op this should be a priority for the county. I know that without the resources and assistance my, C my CCIC I provided, I would not be in the position to succeed that I am in now. Investing resources into the students that truly need it the most through a position that has the opportunity to change a student's life course is key. So once again, I urge you to take notice of this issue, take action, and make MCPS a more equitable school system. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, let's hear from Sami Saeed. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sammy Saeed, and I am the school president at Richard Montgomery High School and a candidate for the 46th student member of the board. I first want to extend my thanks to the Board of Education and Dr. McKnight for giving me the opportunity to speak at this hearing tonight. As we all know, the quality of education our students receive is of utmost importance. However, we often overlook one crucial aspect of their development, school lunches. The food that our students eat during the school day plays a vital role in their physical and mental well-being. And it is our responsibility to ensure that they are provided with both nutritious and delicious meals. Unfortunately, the reality is that many of our schools are falling short when it comes to school lunch quality. I vividly remember receiving food made in our cafeterias that are absolutely appalling to even look at. Chicken with mold on it, french fries that are green and stick to the plate, meatballs that bounce when you drop them, you name it. These kinds of meals are not the type that should be present in a county with a budget of over $3 billion. We must do better for our students. We need to invest in fresh, whole foods that are student taste tested to ensure they look nothing like what we are feeding our students today. We need to offer a variety of meal options, including halal, kosher, and many others to accommodate the diverse dietary needs of our student body. We as a county need to ensure that not a single student is left behind in their ability to enjoy a school lunch that is inclusive of their culture and their beliefs. And most of all, we need to provide our students with lunches that they will be excited to eat, not lunches that will give them a trip to the doctor's office after school. By providing students with healthy and delicious lunches, we are not only investing in their phys physical well-being, but their academic performance. Studies have shown that students who eat nutritious meals perform better in school and are actually more likely to graduate. So think about it like this. School lunches are not just sm some small aspect of our students' day that they shouldn't complain about, but crucial in aiding students in their future careers. So let's make our school lunches nutritious and delicious for all students across MCPS, as the truth is our future depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, let's hear from Olivia Ding.
Good evening, members of the Board of Education. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony today at the operating budget hearing. My name is Olivia Ding, and I'm a sophomore at Poolsville High School in the Humanities Magnet Program. As a magnet student, my curriculum requires me to take a certain set of advanced placement courses, otherwise known as APs. Attached to these APs are end of the year exams, costing about $97 per test. A student taking multiple tests is forced to shoulder an unfathomable price, which is what most students in these rigorous programs are expected to do as the number of required AP classes grow each year. Due to these extreme costs, many of my peers shy away from involving themselves in additional AP classes outside of the required ones, although they are interested in learning more about these different subjects. When I asked my friend why she chose not to enroll in AP psychology, she simply stated, another AP exam is another $100 lost. Another AP exam is enough to feed my family for a month, buy a pair of shoes, help pay the electricity bill. Although the AP fee waiver option exists, it is not nearly as publicized as it should be. I'd never even heard about the alternative until I was informed by a friend. Going into the school year, my family was incredibly anxious knowing that they would have to carry the financial burden of paying the exam fees, totaling around $600 for both me and my brother. This reduction not only relieved the pressure from my household, but it also made AP exams more accessible for me to take regardless of my financial situation. However, it frustrates and disappoints me knowing that there are hundreds of other families with children in MCPS who are unbeknownst and missing out on this waiver, currently struggling to deal with the hardships of these costs. These are just a few of the reasons why students opt to take less, if not none, of these AP courses designed to help prepare them for college and higher education. If we as a county truly prioritize college and career readiness, then we must address this roadblock, preventing countless students from receiving the same education and preparation. Members of the Board of Education, as you decide what to do with the $3.15 billion of proposed funding for fiscal year 2024, please consider allocating a fraction of the budget towards waiving the AP and IB exam fees for each and every student of MCPS. All learners deserve the opportunity to discover their passions without the stress of paying hundreds of dollars. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Let's hear, Mr. Savarna is on his way, so let's hear from Aaron Kim. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Erin Kim, and I'm currently a junior at Walter Johnson High School. I've been the Class of 24 president for the past three years, and I hold various leadership positions in countywide organizations. Today, I will be talking about why I sincerely believe that the fees for AP and IB exams should be waived. As a student, the place where I see and feel the least diversity are my AP classes. Walter Johnson, which again is the school I attend right now, has a minority population of 48%, which is about half of the student body. Yet, when I enter my AP language and composition class or my AP US history class, it's hard to see even 10 students, 10 minority students, including myself, in a class of 30. The opportunity gap is one of the biggest issues that MCPS is, is tackling today, and I believe that waiving exam fees will be a huge step forward for this issue. AP classes are beneficial in so many ways, like helping students with time management, teaching students how to prioritize, diving deeper into topics that regular classes don't, and providing students who plan on going to college with an opportunity to receive college credit. By removing AP exam fees, we encourage students that would normally be hesitant of taking AP classes to challenge themselves and reach their full potential. Moreover, for students who want, to, want that challenge but lack the opportunity due to the fact that they're taking multiple APs already or have siblings, this fee waiver would be MCPS's way of allowing these students to thrive. As a county whose core purpose is to prepare all students to thrive in their future, we should not be adding a financial barrier in front of students who wish to challenge themselves, who wish to reach their full academic potential, 
and who wish to get the most out of their MCPS education. Finally, before I end, I want to reiterate something that was mentioned by my colleague Sam Ross about the importance of communication last week. If these proposals are adopted, the most important part will be making sure that students and families are aware of these changes and opportunities. If students and families do not know about these amazing resources, the hours of time and effort put in by MCPS staff will be all going to waste. Thank you so much for your time and, oppor and the opportunity to speak today, and I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, let's hear from Alexander Max. Alexander Max. Okay, let's uh, move on with uh, Pranil Suvarna. Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Pranil Suvarna, and I'm a, a sophomore at Clarksburg High School and a candidate for the 46th student member of the board. As we look to the future of our schools, one of the most pressing issues we must address is sustainability. Climate change, dwindling natural resources, and pollution are just a few of the problems facing our planet today, and it's our duty as a school system to not only prepare our students for the world they will inherit, but to contribute to making that world a better place. One of the key ways we can promote sustainability in our schools is by dedicating more of our resources to environmentally sustainable measures. This can include things like implementing recycling programs, switching to energy efficient lighting and heating systems, and investing in renewable energy resources. Many organizations and government agencies provide fundings for, for schools that are working to reduce their environmental impact and promote sustainability. So not only do these measures help to reduce our environmental footprint, but they also lead to long-term cost savings and create a healthier and safer learning environment for our students. A prime example of this is geothermal heating systems. Geothermal heating systems use heat from the ground to heat buildings in the winter and cool them in the summer. They are not only efficient and sustainable, but reliable. By implementing these systems, we can make sure that students are comfortable in their classes year round while making a positive impact on the environment. Another important aspect of sustainable measures in our schools is composting. By implementing a composting program in our schools, we can reduce the amount of waste sent to landfills and create a valuable resource for our gardens and landscaping. Composting also serves as a valuable educational tool, teaching students about the importance of waste reduction and the natural process of decomposition. A possible solution I have personally researched is carbon sequestration via our soil. Soil acts as a major carbon sink, meaning that it can absorb more carbon than it releases. And there are ways for us to utilize that, this property to mitigate our emissions countywide. MCPS can work with the Agricultural Reserve to use innovative farming practices, such as rotational farming and cover crops, alongside composting systems, which generate more soil organic carbon. Additionally, implementing sustainable measures, such as green roofs and natural lighting, can improve indoor air quality, leading to a healthier and safer learning environment for our students and staff. By incorporating sustainability education into our curriculum, we can empower our students to make informed decisions and take actions that promote a sustainable future. This can include participating in conservation projects, volunteering in their local communities to promote sustainable practices, and learning about the impact of, the hu of human activity on the environment. In conclusion, investing in sustainable measures is not only the right thing to do for the planet, but it also makes financial sense and creates a healthier and safer learning environment. As a school system, it is our responsibility to prioritize sustainability and ensure that our schools are doing their part to create a more sustainable future for all. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah Solomon. Hannah Solomon. Good evening, Dr. McKnight and members of the Board of Education. I'd like to preface by thanking you for allowing myself and many others the opportunity to assert our positions as MCPS students seeking to make change. My name is Hannah Solomon, and I'm in my first year at Richard Montgomery High School. I find that an indispensable part of the commencement of this revision process for the operating budget is that we are properly recognizing its many beneficial upcoming undertakings, including that of the increased focus on job training and employment opportunities, and even increased technology implementation. 
However, juxtaposing that of our immense accomplishments are the areas in our budget that still require some form of augmentation. Today, I speak to you on the subject of a comprehensive broadening of courses and general readiness programs. As we all know, MCPS is filled with incredibly ambitious students who strive for incredible things. And in order to foster an environment in which students can live up to their fullest potentials, it is imperative that we ascertain that we are continually expanding academic programs. It is often that I hear from peers of the insufficiencies in certain course offerings or simply failure to integrate them into MCPS at all. The AP Capstone Diploma Program, for instance, is extremely beneficial for college. It is said to develop fundamental skills that students will use in not only courses taken throughout their high school careers, but for the duration of college as well. Some students have even voiced concerns about disparities in language programs offered, seeking more variety in in-person courses for further enrichment. There is also much to be said as it pertains to college and career readiness in MCPS. Oftentimes, discussions centered around college begin around 11th and 12th grade. Personal experience has led me to believe that students could benefit from the initiation of these conversations starting as early as 9th or 10th grade. Sorry. Incentivizing this could be particularly conducive to how students make critical academic decisions throughout high school and aid them in traversing the rather overwhelming process that are college applications. Guiding and consulting more generally through early years and later clarifying the content of these discussions has proven to be effective for others and should be so for MCPS students as well. This is a sentiment I feel that is echoed among many other high school students. In fully utilizing the allocation for these programs, we would be reinforcing shortcomings made so vast by what is failure to act upon them while they serve as problems to MCPS students today. The improvement of programs already set in place by MCPS and the implementation of new programs at MCPS would only be a step towards resolving this ongoing issue. Thank you for your time and consideration. I urge you to weigh the utter significance of these issues going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Let's play our first uh, video from Wilson Fawcett. Please play the video. Board of Education members, thank you for your time. My name is Wilson Fawcett and I'm a ninth grader at Walter Johnson High School. It is evident that the environment is suffering. From the struggling Chesapeake Bay, a local treasure, to worldwide weather problems, the issues are clear. And at the heart of all of this is the rapidly rising temperature, global warming. This is going to be a huge problem that faces the coming generations. MCPS is, however, leading the way in many aspects in terms of school systems fighting global warming. Most recently, MCPS just received the largest fleet of electric buses in the nation. The board passed policy ECA to commit to significantly reducing and then eliminating emissions, and many schools have green features such as solar panels, green roofs, geothermal systems, and bioretention systems. Yet, there are 210 MCPS schools, and not all have green features. Less than 100 of the more than 1,000 MCPS buses are electric. If MCPS is leading the nation, is this what leading the nation in terms of reducing negative environmental impacts should look like? This is a worldwide issue, not just an issue in MCPS. Individuals as well as organizations need to begin to make larger sacrifices, larger investments in order to fight global warming. Therefore, as the Board of Education and MCPS staff reviews the operating budget, it is imperative that every single action be take, being taken is evaluated and made as environmentally friendly as possible. Additionally, the funding needs to be there in the budget in order to meet the emissions goals that MCPS has set. And MCPS should also work to create more transparency in regards to their progress on sustainability related measures, particularly in regards to policy ECA's goals. This could be done through a dashboard on the website, signage at schools, as well as media campaigns. And the importance of MCPS taking action immediately cannot be understated. The students of MCPS are the leaders of tomorrow. They will look to what their teachers are doing, what their schools are doing, and what MCPS is doing today as a guide to how to act in the future. Therefore, if humanity is going to solve the climate crisis, the education sector, in this case MCPS, must demonstrate to future leaders that making sacrifices for the environment is doable and necessary. Therefore, I ask that MCPS dedicates more resources and funding to supporting environmental efforts in this budget. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Up next is a video by Lydia Kim. 
Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Lydia Kim, and I am a freshman at Poolsla High School. I'm here today, like everyone, to discuss the 2024 fiscal year operating budget. First of all, I'd like to start with some statistics. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 14, according to the CDC, as, you're, as you may already know. Additionally, one in five students suffer from a mental health disorder, but only 20% of them receive adequate mental health services and support. While we agree that teen suicide is an important issue, you may wonder how this connects to our 2024 budget. Upon reading the hundreds of pages for the recommended budget, I realized that it seems to be another year with a lack of school psychologists, teletherapy, or other forms of mental health support. The National Association of School Psychologists recommend a ratio of one school psychologist per 500 students. However, this school year's school psychologist assignments included our county has never had quote unquote enough school psychologists if we follow this ratio. While I agree. I, while I agree that finding school psychologists and allowing students to utilize these resources can be extremely difficult, I strongly believe that school psychologists and access to teletherapy can significantly help our students' mental health and aid in suicide prevention. Therefore, I urge the Board of Education to include teletherapy, school psychologists, and other forms of mental health support in our next budget. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Please play the video for Peter Boyko. Good evening, Dr. McKnight, President Silvestri, and members of the MCPS Board of Education. My name is Peter Boyko, and I'm a freshman at Northwest High School. I'm also the co-president of EcoMoco, a local student-led environmental organization. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am testifying to urge the Montgomery County Board of Education to allocate funding in the fiscal year 2024 operating budget towards sustainability projects and initiatives. Last school year, MCPS committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2027, just four short years away. If we want to achieve this goal and turn MCPS into a thriving, eco-friendly school system, we have to act immediately. I'm sure you're all aware that climate change right now is causing devastating harm all over the world. In Pakistan, over 1,300 people were killed due to unprecedented flooding. Wildfires fueled by hot weather in Australia and California forced millions of residents to evacuate their homes. Global warming has exacerbated non-communicable illnesses such as asthma as well and led to a global rise in hunger, malnutrition, famine, and poverty. The effects of the climate crisis are serious and should be taken seriously. So far in MCPS, we've come a long way. MCPS is rolling out electric school buses, committing to fully reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2035, installing reusable water bottle filling stations at every school, and more. However, very rarely have we used the operating budget to tackle climate change and make investments towards a cleaner, more sustainable future. We can start by implementing more solar panels and other renewable energy systems. According to the MCPS Division of Sustainability and Compliance webpage on the MCPS website, only 17 out of 200 schools have solar panels. That is only 8% of schools. Increasing solar panels will not only benefit our environment, but MCPS financially. According to the Renewable Energy page on the MCPS website, MCPS saves $300,000 annually thanks to these solar systems. In addition, currently MCPS purchases only 38% of its electricity from renewable energy sources. We must increase this number by purchasing more of our electricity from these sources. However, all in all, it needs to start with the operating budget. If MCPS is truly committed towards sustainability and combating the climate crisis, we must take bold steps forward in the right direction, and we can do that through the operating budget. Let's secure a clean and healthier future for my generation and generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did Alexander Max make it in? No? Okay. Well, thank you to all our students who made the time to provide testimony, uh, either in person or video. And now uh, we will pause and take questions or comments from our board members, starting with Ms. Yang. Um, I want to thank our students for coming in. They have provided such uh, uh, some of the very good suggestions. And also, I want to assure 
you that we hear loud and clear your issue on AP IB test exam fees, sustainability, uh, mental health, and, and lunch, very important about lunch. So thank you so much for coming in. Please stay engaged and keep coming to tell us how we can do better. Thank you. Ms. Harris? Yes, thank you again, students, um, for such constructive testimony. Um, and uh, first, on Ms. Uh, Gebra Selassie's comment around our college and career coordinator positions in our schools, I think she makes a very cogent point that um, the, uh, having a more proportional assignment of those resources would be a true measure towards equity. Right now, we have a, 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 our approach to college and career um, counselors is an equal one. Every school has the same, but as we all know that equity isn't giving everyone the same. And so I think, um, I mean, she had a very good uh, idea around looking at the uh, percentage of students who are first generation, so don't have that history of supports in their family or an expectation around college. Um, and also our students who um, are uh, low income and may not perceive college as an actual option for them. And um, anyway, it was, a, again, a very constructive idea and a very, a very salient point, I thought. Um, and I did want to mention that um, fully a third of our students here tonight raise issues of sustainability. And uh, Mr. Boyko, Mr. Suvarna, and Mr. Fawcett. And I very much appreciated the constructive nature of what they brought to the table. And I share their um, vision and I will be looking very closely at the operating budget to see that our, the sustainability, the promises that we made when we passed our aggressive new sustainability policy last June are in fact carried forward in our operating budget. As um, Mr. Hall told me when I first met him, show me your budget and I will show you your priorities. So, um, yes, thank you very much. Ms. Evans. I have nothing to add. I don't want to be repetitive, but I do want to thank our students for coming out, as always, and giving um, very thoughtful testimony. And um, we appreciate you for really um, engaging in your education. So thank you. Ms. Wolf? I, too, want to thank our students for coming out. I heard several themes, the theme of sustainability, equity, meals, which I consider wellness, and communication. All of these issues are in our strategic plan. So know that we heard you. We may not be able to accomplish everything, but we did hear you. And we do agree that these are high priority issues. Ms. Grace Rivetta Oven. Um, well, thank you to, um, to Malat, Samuel, Livia, Pranil, Aaron, Hannah, Wilson, Lydia, and Peter. You guys makes us very proud. Um, to be part of this community. You guys are really leaders, and I just want to say thank you for taking the time. And it's not easy to come to speak to a room full of adults. Um, so, but what we hear from you is um, a lot of the things that we've been talking about that we need. So I want you to know, especially with the costs for AP and so on, it is a burden on many families, um, especially those um, who are facing other issues, you know, food insecurity, rental, um, the cost of gas, everything, right? So I just want to say thank you for bringing that to the front. And uh, we are going to be taking actions. I think you're going to be very happy with some of the plans that Dr. Mike Knight has in order to alleviate that. And on the nutrition fact, many people know that that's very close to my heart, uh, food insecurity and nutrition. So we hear you um, loud and clear. And I know we have plans to also uh, engage students in that process and to make nutrition a priority, and just happy to see the young people bringing the voices for the environment. We're seeing it. We're seeing it in California. We're seeing how devastating it is. And we are very lucky to live in a county that is very proactive and that has young voices who are standing by to make sure that those issues come to the front. Thank you. Moving on to our next set of speakers. Uh, Let's move on to hear from Allison Flepson.
Uh, good evening, buenas noches. My name is Allison Flepson, and I'm the parent of a kindergartner and a third grader at Oakland, Tellis, Oakland Terrace Elementary, a two-way Spanish-English immersion school with more than 500 students. I am also the president of the school's PTA. Tonight, I am speaking on behalf of more than 100 parents who have signed this testimony. I'm here to express families' concerns regarding large class sizes at our school and to request action be taken in the FY 2024 budget to rectify the situation. At Oakland Terrace, teachers instruct twice as many students as their colleagues at most other elementary schools. Our TWI teachers teach two groups of students every day, a cohort of students in their homeroom class as well as a cohort in their co-teachers class. This is because one teacher provides instruction in English and the other in Spanish. As a result of our school losing focus status this year, we have seen individual class sizes balloon to unacceptable levels for a dual language program. For example, the number of children in each kindergarten class this year jumped from approximately 16 last year to 26 this year, with similar increases in other grades. This means that teachers are responsible for teaching, grading, managing, and supporting more than 50 students every day, a workload that is unacceptable and unsustainable. Our teachers, school leadership, and support staff are doing everything they can in the face of this adversity. But the only way to solve this problem and to reduce class sizes is for MCPS to provide more funding for more teachers in this TWI program. This is critical because smaller class sizes are essential to provide the highest quality dual language instruction, to enable teachers to differentiate instruction, and to avoid challenges recruiting and retaining teachers for this unique program. Oakland Terrace and all TWI schools, which I know Ms. Evans and Dr. McKnight recently visited, need to have the requisite human and other resource to implement the program well. Importantly, this funding should not be contingent on focus or Title I status, but should be based on what is needed to successfully implement the program. Secondly, we would like to express additional concerns and recommendations regarding the TWI program. These include the following. First, MCPS and the Board of Education need to develop a strategic plan for the TWI program. According to MCPS's own special programs regulations, the district must develop a plan that includes the program's goals and objectives. Curricula, materials, and other aspects of the program, including school selection, must be aligned. We encourage MCPS to incorporate into the plan recommendations described in the report, potential pathways to equitable foreign language immersion and dual language education in MCPS, as well as to involve all stakeholders, including parents and caregivers, into its development. Second, the TDI program still needs to identify curriculum materials for all subjects. We appreciate that MCPS is in the process of identifying new English and Spanish language arts materials. These should align with the program's goals, be tailored to this dual language program, and allow for differentiated instruction based on learner language profiles and needs, which differ between and within TWI schools. Additionally, MCPS needs to devote resources to procure or develop materials in Spanish for social studies and science. The Enriched Literacy Curriculum, or ELC, also should be offered at TWI schools. Third, the TWI program needs to be comprehensively evaluated, something I know I've spoken to several of you about in previous years. As outlined in the special programs regulation, an evaluation of the TWI program needs to be presented to the superintendent, or by the superintendent to the Board of Education with a recommendation to continue, revise, or terminate the program. Since the program began at Oakland Terrace in 2018, MCPS has only produced one public report, a formative evaluation in 2019. Given this, we strongly urge MCPS to dedicate FY24 funds to comprehensively and rigorously monitor and evaluate the program to allow educators, policymakers, and families to gain better insight into student achievement across languages, subjects, and schools, and to identify where the program is succeeding and where it needs to be improved. This is imperative given how many years the TWI program has already been implemented and MCPS's plans to expand it next year. Lastly, MCPS needs to clarify and publicize its policy for student placement in TWI schools. To date, MCPS has not shared the process or requirements for students to enroll in a TWI school beyond kindergarten. Families who move into the neighborhood with a TWI school cannot find information online about the language requirements or the alternative school they need to attend if they don't meet them. MCPS needs to be transparent about this process. Our school community overwhelmingly supports the opportunity for bilingual learning. However, MCPS and the Board of Education need to provide the requisite resources for teachers and students for it to be successful. 
We ask MCPS and the board to include in the FY24 budget sufficient teaching staff to lower class sizes at our school, Oakland Terrace, and other TWI schools as needed as the county endeavors to improve and expand this important program. Thank, Thank you. you. Up next, let's hear from Jennifer Martin. Good evening, Superintendent Dr. McKnight, Board President Silvestri, Board Vice President Evans, and members of the Board of Education. Um, Dr. Handy, Ms. Morrison, and I thank you for this opportunity to deliver testimony together on behalf of the 24,000 members we collectively represent and the students those members serve. All of us are proud of the work MCPS employees do each day to provide an excellent education in safe and welcoming schools. From bus drivers to food service and building services staff to paraeducators, counselors, psychologists, classroom teachers, specialists, administrators, and more, all of us dedicate ourselves to making sure every student gets the support they need to make the most of learning opportunities that will prepare them for their futures. Our members love what they do for our students, and we love our public schools. So we must not shy away from speaking about the problems we are facing. We call upon you to honor our students and staff by creating a budget that fully addresses needs that for too long have gone unmet. The percentage of students eligible for free and reduced meals and of those requiring special education and English language services has grown markedly over the past decade. Their need for mental health and social services has grown as well. But when adjusted for inflation, per pupil spending is below what we were spending in 2009. The racial demographics of our schools have changed too. The majority of our students are now students of color. So, as the racial composition of our schools has changed, our investment in students has been reduced. What does this say about our commitment to equity? We agree with Dr. McKnight that we must reinvest in our schools if we are to remain competitive in and attracting and retaining high quality educators and staff our students deserve. Unfortunately, we do not agree that the budget proposal the superintendent has presented on December 19th goes far enough to attract and retain the best employees. Staffing shortages remain a problem that has led to untenable workloads and burnout. Surrounding counties and DC are offering compensation that is tempting MCPS employees to leave for greener pastures. We are no longer first in Maryland for teacher compensation, but now rank fifth. Moreover, other counties like Prince George's give full credit for years of service to those they hire with previous experience. When adjusted for inflation, MCA unit members are making 15 to 17 percent less than they were at the same place on the salary scale 20 years ago. If we are to have the schools our students deserve, we must invest in the people who do the work. The blueprint for Maryland's future, which mandates raising teacher salaries to $60,000 and providing career advancement opportunities, requires that the county increase its contribution to school funding. This new Maryland law recognizes that for our students to succeed, we must support all staff by creating reasonable work demands and professional advancement pathways, and by providing compensation that shows respect for their contributions. Create a budget that truly makes that possible, and we and our members will stand beside you. The fight for the investment needed to address more than a decade of underfunding is something we can do together. The quality of our schools drives the prosperity of this county. Standing together, we can renew our schools to be the jewels in the crown of Montgomery County, places where staff have the time and energy to work with parents as partners and tailor lessons to tap into students' creativity, skills, and interests. Schools where every child gets the personalized attention and excellent education they deserve. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Morrison. 
Good evening. A year ago, Presidents Martin, Dr. Handy, and I joined you to discuss the budget and share our thoughts on what then Interim Superintendent Dr. McKnight needed to be as successful as she deserved. As the first black woman to lead the school system, her success will significantly impact the diverse students and communities across this county. As union partners, we appreciate the need for leaders who reflect our county's diversity. As recently as 2010, MCPS's operating budget accounted for 53% of the Montgom Montgomery County operating budget. Today, it is less than half. The four percentage point decrease amounts to approximately $230 million less in funding to MCPS. As the president of SEIU, I frequently speak to support staff professionals who end their work day each day at MCPS schools and non-school based offices and head to their second or third jobs to make ends meet. Most do not work full time hours at MCPS and often wait almost two full months after school starts to get an entire paycheck. Support staff professionals are scrambling to figure out how they will support themselves and their families. Neighboring school districts have committed to substantial multi-year wage adjustments for their staff. MCPS must commit to ensuring staff is adequately compensated for their work. MCPS parents expect their children to have a world-class education and support staff professionals have committed themselves to this work. Communities across this county continue to question whether we are genuinely committed to rebuilding for equity and excellence. To make our schools a draw for families and businesses, we must make the proper investment to ensure that MCPS has adequate resources to provide excellent services. As Dr. McKnight and the board prepare to recommend a budget to the county executive and county council, it is time to request funding to move our school system forward in addressing the persistent inequities that hinder our students' success. We must ask for what we need to provide the world-class education and working environments that our students and staff so greatly deserve. Superintendent Dr. McKnight and Board of Education members speak up and ask for what? our students and staff need. Do not negotiate against yourself. Put the onus on the county council, some of whom proudly put our logos on their campaign literature when they were running for office not two months ago. Push them to show proper care for a student body that is becoming more diverse every year. We will have your back, we promise you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Handy. Superintendent Dr. McKnight, Board President Silvestri, Board Vice President Evans, newly elected members of the Board of Education and returning members of the Board of Education. Thank you for granting us this opportunity to speak with you this evening. As the president of McCap and McBoa, I am proud to join Presidents Martin and Morrison this evening. We are united in our call for additional funding beyond the current proposal made by Dr. McKnight for fiscal year 2024. We represent different sets of employees in the system, but the three of us are united in seeking to ensure all of our members have the resources needed to provide our students with truly world-class education. For too long, the county has relied on MCPS employees to shoulder additional burdens and take up new initiatives without providing sufficient personnel and resources to ensure success then we are held accountable when problems persist. Our members are tired, some demoralized, and some are looking for professional opportunities elsewhere, developing an exit plan. As for salaries, compensation for MCPS administrators has not kept pace with salaries in area school systems in Maryland, Northern Virginia, and Washington, D.C. We are losing great school leaders to neighboring counties and it is not just because they know other superintendents. Those counties pay substantially more than MCPS. The 3.35% COLA in December was a start to raising our compensation, but at the same time, it does not compete with the 7% COLA in Frederick County, the 5% in Prince George's County, and or the 4% in Fairfax, who already pay more than MCPS. We currently have a proposed budget that is 8.1% more than last year, 
but we have been told that the COLA certainly will not reflect that percent. The superintendent in Frederick has already called for a 6% COLA for their employees next year, and the administrators in Prince George's have an agreement to receive 4% increase and will be adding another step to their salary scale. If the board doesn't act on our salary scales and offer a competitive COLA in July, as other LEAs in Maryland, MCPS will continue to fall further and further behind. Any recruitment advantage that we think we may have will become irrelevant as people will accept similar positions that pay better in other districts. Moreover, as staffing shortages persist, school administrators and MCPS find themselves assuming classroom duties, finding coverage daily, and doing way more than other duties as a sign to keep the ship afloat. This has a domino effect when it neg negatively impacts the time to be instructional leaders and to provide the feedback and support imperative to help our staff grow professionally and connect to community stakeholders. We struggle to meet the system's ever-increasing demands and attention on new initiatives while supporting implementation of effective, creative, and culturally conscious instruction to meet the needs of our diverse student body. Our leaders neglect their own families and compromise their own well-being with an overwhelming workload and unbalanced work life while focusing on the education, well-being, and safety of our students and staff. The FY24 MCPS budget needs to be truly student-centered, and it needs to be sufficient to ensure that we can attract and retain the best employees so that as a system, our employees can give their best to ensure all of our students achieve their full potential. We simply cannot afford to not be competitive at a time when the supply and demand for educators does not match within the state and across the USA. We are your partners on this journey. I like to call challenges opportunities. And right now we have an opportunity to ensure that every young person in our care gets a world-class education and a school community that focuses on the well-being and academic excellence of every individual. We ask that you strongly advocate for our students, for our staff, and the needs of our schools, and know that we will be right there with you. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And I just before I take my seat, I just wanted to give a shout out to my sorority sisters of Delta Sigma Theta from the Potomac Valley Alumni Chapter for being here tonight, demonstrating a community interest in the MCPS budget process, looking lovely in red. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Up next, let's hear from Wailea Chase. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. McKnight and MCPS Board of Education members returning and new. My name is Wailea Chase, and I'm here this evening to provide public testimony on behalf of the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity and Excellence. I attended Dr. McKnight's rollout of the proposed MCPS FY24 budget at Richard Montgomery High School, and I was very excited. I paid rapt attention. The BBC, is appreciative of the initiatives that will be funded in our superintendent's proposed budget. Initiatives such as investments in innovative calendar schools, middle years IB and AP, dual language programming, early childhood, teacher recruitment and retention, etc. In taking a deeper dive into the proposed budget, we began looking for the alignment between the proposed funding and the investment in equity. We have some questions. Questions such as, what are the key investments to move the needle on literacy and math? We heard about the 26 Learning and Achievement Specialists, LAS, but is that the investment that will move the needle forward for all MCPS students, black and brown, low-income students in particular, whose learning loss was the most severely and negatively impacted during the last three years? Beyond the LAS, what is the plan to accelerate learning recovery in literacy and math especially? MCPS's own recent evidence of learning data is beyond concerning, and we believe that among the highest priority should be a clear and transparent plan included in this budget to show the investments in accelerated learning recovery. We understand that tutoring has been a part of the plan. Please share the data to support the efficacy of tutoring to date, 
before more dollars are put towards it. High dosage tutoring was mentioned as a part of the plan, but when considering this as a continued intervention, is MCPS only looking at evidence of learning data at the classroom slash school level, or will the budget include investments to ensure that all students, especially those most severely impacted, are meeting both district and classroom standards? Because the current evidence of learning data shows that while a student can have a classroom grade of B, for example, that same student can have a below grade level score on district and standardized tests. That B in the classroom means that a student doesn't meet the criteria for tutoring, but the standardized district test score says that they do. Again, please make sure that this budget will show investments to ensure that all students are meeting both district and in-classroom standards and are on grade level in every grade at every school. The, BB the BBC contends that this is a critical equity issue. We have more questions. How does this budget ensure that the most effective practices in promoting literacy and math success are scaled to reach all schools, particularly those, particularly those where black, brown, and students of low income are underperforming? MCPS has routinely high highlighted other schools that have the secret sauce. What are the investments in this budget to identify and implement best practices and scale these best practices to reach all students? Since its inception four years ago, the BBC has been focused on advocating for resource equity for black and brown and low income students to have effective leaders and teachers. It's one of our five asks. We would like to know the, prog the progress MCPS is making and will include as an investment in this budget in removing barriers to getting effective leaders and teachers to the students who need the most. Lastly, Please show us in this budget the alignment with the anti-racist findings and recommendations as it relates to systemic changes for the good of our MCPS community. I can't leave here this meeting this evening without mentioning the vital work of the MCPS equity unit, which we do not see reflected in this current budget proposal. Is this equity we can see? Thank you for your time and attention this evening. Thank you. Up next, let's hear from Byron Johns. Good evening, and thank you to all the people that came out tonight to support this testimony, and I'll be the second to thank our friends and supporters from uh, the Delta Sigma Theta uh, sorority here from Potomac Valley and Montgomery County. My name is Byron Johns, and I want to welcome our new board members, Ms. Yang and Ms. Uh, Rivera Oven. Um, my name is Byron Johns, and I'm here to comment, provide comments on behalf of the NAACP Montgomery County Parents Council and the Black and Brown Coalition for Educational Equity and Excellence. We believe, along with MCPS, in investing in initiatives that level the playing field for the students so that every student leaves MCPS career and college ready. We appreciate the superintendent's proposed 2024 budget of 3.2 billion and the innovative programs investments in early childhood innovative calendar schools, dual language middle years, advanced college bound programs, which have long-term promise to address the needs of students and to expand equitable access to critical learning. That said, we firmly believe MCPS's highest priority must be the work of accelerating recovery to on grade level learning for underserved students in literacy and math. This will require choices. MCPS's primary intervention has been tutoring and indeed this proposed budget allocates $5 million, $3 million for in-person high dosage intervention, and $2 million for online tutoring, in addition to more dollars through the ESSER funding. The resources currently allocated have reached less than 15% of students, even though MCPS's evidence of learning data makes clear black and brown students, who make up the majority of MCPS students, are not successfully learning on grade level in literacy or math post-pandemic. See the figures in my written testimony that I've attached. 
Our hope and request is that MCPS's current and future budgets will redirect resources to increase and protect the investment in literacy and math so students make urgent progress. Choosing to prioritize funding to academic recovery is in keeping with the board's strategic plan. The evidence of learning data indicates black, brown, and low-income students have severely widening learning gaps, and district and external measures, as shown in the figures attached. For this budget, we ask for more focused investments with a specific and measurable plan for intervention targeted to students who are not meeting evidence of learning grade level standards. We think this is a critical equity issue. Addressing the systemic barriers that resulted in black, brown, and students impacted by poverty being underserved in their education and putting their futures at risk is a core civil rights matter that is long overdue. In addition, true equity budgets require focused and protected investments to implement and scale up best practices, proven successful methods for all student subgroups in practice at identified high performing schools, such as you've identified at Oakland Terrace, so that they reach all students or at least those in underperforming schools. Accelerate planning, implementation, and actively monitoring effective practices that result in measurably improving literacy and math success. Choose to invest in these efforts and demonstrate improvement as a key component of meaningful accountability. This goal will require that MCPS re-examine and reorganize resources in order to deploy all its assets, human and financial, in a more effective way to serve the most underserved students. Finally, since its inception four years ago, the Black and Brown Coalition has advocated for Black and Brown students to have greater access to effective leaders and teachers, responding to the inequities revealed in the 2018 Resource Equity Study. Progress in getting effective leaders and teachers to the students who need them the most should be a criterion tied to the additional investments in this budget. This is all about the choices we make. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, let's hear from Diego Uriburu. Buenas noches. Uh, my name is Diego Uriburu, and I am the Executive Director of Identity, and tonight I'm also testifying uh, with the Black and Brown Coalition. I want to acknowledge the parents that came here tonight wearing blue, so thank you, and everyone else who's here. Nothing compares to how impactful K-12 education is to someone's future, particularly if you're black, brown, and poor. It is a cornerstone upon which most every other knowledge is built. Our communities know this very well. Our children's futures depend on a strong educational system. We see the evidence of learning data, and we are scared scare for our children's future. NCPS, NCPS's data tells us our children urgently need support to meet their needs before they lose the chance to catch up. Two main points tonight. We believe that it is imperative for NCPS to be well-funded. We see the budget and understand the numbers. However, we have no specific idea how these investments uh, called out in these budgets will address our children's burning needs. How do we connect the dots beyond tutoring to ensure that a better educational outcomes for our children? We want to support Dr. Mike Knight's budget. We need, <clears throat> but we need to see the plan of how we will use our resources to connect to a better future for our children. To support this budget, the entire budget, not just the additional 8%, we first need to understand what is it going to accomplish? What is it going to accomplish? Uh, what is the plan? What are the equitable strategies and interventions that, in your view, will turn around the dismal results we're seeing today? Please show us the plan. Please show us the road ahead. Second, <clears throat> we also need to understand how MCPS will ensure that the implementation of such plan 
effectively reaches our communities, particularly, particularly black, brown, and poor, because having excellent programs and interventions that are not used by those who need it the most don't really make a difference. So we have to, this has been a long-standing problem for MCPS, a challenge. So we would love to see in the budget how we're going to become a more responsive, more anti-racist system, and that we engage, better engage, reach out, listen to those communities who need your, our services the most. Uh, if MCPS cannot effectively reach out to our communities, involve them, then the interventions proposed by the budget uh, <coughs> will, will not work. That has been the case in the past years, in the past decades. So let's work together to, to understand what the plan is so we can share with the community, garner support, and also let's ensure that, that whatever the plan is paying for, in addition to tutoring, gets to the hands, ears, and eyes of those who need it the most. Thank you so very much. Thank you. <laughs> Up next, we will hear from Lisa Clark and Robin Hatchell Hart. Good evening, Superintendent, Dr. McKnight, and board members. My name is Lisa Clark, and tonight with my colleague, Robin Hatchelhart, we'd like to tell you about the specialized work we do as people personnel workers, representing 54 unique staff members in MCPS. Last year, we came before you to talk about our commitment and contribution to laying a foundation that ensures children experience success in school. This year, our work is more critical than ever. As our students and families come to us with individual and often critical needs, PPWs are the unique problem solvers equipped to meet those needs and break down barriers. What does it mean to be unique? One definition says, the only one of its kind. Another one, unlike anything else. Well, we are educational specialists certified by MSDE and required by COMAR. With our backgrounds as educators and counselors, we bring a vast amount of experience and knowledge to our role which enables us to support the whole child in every MCPS school. As consultants, we interpret school and state regulations and policies at all levels. We consult with school teams to develop and monitor interventions to ensure all students have access to a free and appropriate public education. As advocates, we foster understanding and collaborative efforts among home, school, and community. We coordinate with a myriad of community, government, and private agencies to move students forward. We work with newcomer families to navigate the school system, expedite enrollments, and get them off to a positive start. We are the key to connecting families with our schools. As liaisons, we create connections where there were none and build the links that students need for success. We strengthen the re relationships between home and school. On any given day, you may find us supporting special enrollments, consulting on special education cases, assisting homeless families, guiding students through the disciplinary process, completing home instruction reviews, providing crisis support, or investigating COSAs. We are also key members in our school's well-being teams. With the increase of mental health professionals and personnel in our schools, we can now service families on an even deeper level. We collaborate to ensure that students and families don't fall between the cracks. We ensure connections are made and parents have access to the services needed. Our families are unique and special. They present us with complex and often challenging circumstances but we are the expert problem solvers, solvers, excuse me. We think outside the box to resolve issues. Our commitment to serving students from pre-K to graduation means we work hard to remove barriers for all students. As new schools come online, please consider appropriate allocations for pupil personnel workers to ensure all schools receive our unique services. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Now we have two videos. Let's play the video for Renata Campanti. Hello, my name is Renata Campanti and I'm speaking today as the chair of the MCCPTA Gifted Education Committee. 
We are grateful that MCPS has funded the Enriched Literacy Curriculum to over 60 additional elementary schools next year and is expanding technology education initiatives and access to inclusive, diverse books and curriculum. We have four priority requests for the next budget operating budget. First, we continue to advocate for a reinstatement of previous headcount to support the accelerated and enriched instruction team and for the creation of a monitoring position within OSSWB to monitor gifted education implementation. The loss in headcount and resources for AI has meant that currently a lot of enriched and accelerated curricula is developed by content areas within OSIP. Already small teams overburdened with development of standard curriculum and whose expertise is not in the field of gifted education. We need a larger AI team to collaborate with all the many OSIP teams and more importantly, to lead curriculum development in gifted education as the experts they are in the field. We cannot continue to leave curriculum and professional development and gifted ed across all subject areas, across grade levels, and in magnet and local schools in a county this size to a team of five staff. MCPS has requested a number of new positions in central office, and yet, despite being alerted to the many problems that plague gifted education in this county by our committee, which filed a complaint from the public last year, MCPS has chosen to not invest in new positions in gifted education. MCPS also needs a dedicated gifted education position within OSSWB, for which we have advocated last year and continue to do so. As demonstrated at length by our committee's complaint from the public, implementation of gifted education in MCPS has not been monitored in accordance with policy standards. MCPS needs to recognize that the current staff structure has proven unable to monitor these programs and create a position to do so. Second, GC requests that MCPS improves gifted options in secondary schools by funding and developing designated science and English gifted, gifted courses in middle school, developing proper gifted level honors English nine and 10 courses, and funding STEM enrichment activities in all schools. MCPS is required by Comar and Policy IOA to provide gifted students with an accelerated and rich program in each subject area, routinely in every school K-12. However, local middle schools do not offer designated English and science courses comparable to those offered in the magnet schools. It is therefore a matter of luck if a kid will receive strong gifted instruction in middle school science or English as it is undeniable that kids selected in the magnet lottery receive far superior instruction than their counterparts who are merely waitlisted. We also urge MCPS to create honors English courses in grade nine and 10 that meet the needs of gifted students as these curricula are revised this year. We also echo the curriculum committee's request that MCPS fund STEM activities, enrichment activities in all schools, including virtual options for math club or science fair to reach students at schools without on-site options and to explore opening regional hubs. Our third priority pertains to the enriched literacy curriculum. While we are grateful that MCPS has heard our multiple pleas last year about the ELC, the current plans leave out fifth graders in all new ELC schools and kids who attend non-emergent programs housed in, sc in schools that also house an emergent program. We believe that all fourth and fifth graders whose needs would be better met by the ELC and who receive instruction in English speaking programs should receive access to it, no matter if the school also houses an emergent program in which these kids do not participate in or are new to the ELC. Finally, we urge MCPS once again to use measures of potential inability as part of the gifted education, the gifted identification process and center magnet selection processes as an additional data point to find gifted students that will not be identified solely through achievement-based measures. Those most vulnerable, vulnerable are our ESOL and special ed students. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, please play the video for Evelyn Chung. Members of the Board of Education, my name is Evelyn Chung. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the operating budget as the chair of the MCCPTA Curriculum Committee. I encourage you to review our committee's work plan, which summarizes our committee priorities this year. 
We are very pleased to see MCPS continuing to fund many curriculum programs that we have advocated for. Highlights include the technology education initiatives, structured literacy rollout, a new elementary um, ELA curriculum, enriched literacy curriculum in all schools, and outdoor education. We also applaud MCPS's ongoing investments in an inclusive curriculum and professional development to address all forms of bias, including racism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, sexism, and homophobia. And we also support the continuing investment in summer and tutoring programs, which remain critical to restoring learning loss after the disruptions of the last three years. However, as MCPS establishes, expands, or eliminates programs, we ask it to establish clear goals for all of its programs and publish its findings on whether meaningful benchmarks are being made. <clears throat> for example, MCPS has decided to expand two-way immersion programs, but not, has not established or published clear measurable goals for these immersion programs, including what milestones students are expected to meet each year for the target language. As a result, both one-way and two-way immersions lack a specific curriculum that matches or assesses these learning goals and provides training and resources to differentiate within immersion classrooms. Teachers and schools are making up the curriculum as they go. In addition, based on community feedback, we have five areas where we would like MCPS to focus its funding. First, math supports. Our members continue to be concerned about the missing math content and the impact that learning math online has had at all levels from elementary to high school. While ELA performance is starting to improve, math outcomes lag behind. So families would like to see sufficient staffing and funding to support the following. First, teacher training um, to use non-graded classroom assessments to see where gaps are for individual students so that students can make realistic decisions early on about course selection. Uh, providing more academic and supports um, on campus and during the school day, families report that they haven't heard about the free online tutoring services or that their child does not want more online learning. We've asked for MCS has not published the data on the various tutoring programs to show how much they're used across school or um, demographic profiles. Uh, providing access to textbooks or study guides for math courses after algebra, which do not currently exist. Some teachers and schools offer these materials on their own, but this is not consistent across schools and classrooms. And without textbooks or study guides, students have difficulty studying on their own or getting outside help, and their parents and guardians have difficulty helping their children. A second focus area is um, STEM enrichment activities in all schools. We applaud the budget's additional funding for after-school activities and competitions, especially in STEM. However, finding staff sponsored for local STEM clubs remains an obstacle, and there are many schools that do not have science, technology, or math after-school clubs. We urge MCPS to fund virtual options for math club or science fair to reach students at these schools and to explore opening regional hubs. For more on this issue, please read the summary linked in our written testimony. A third request is for sufficient staffing to provide teachers with adequate planning time so that they can effectively implement a curriculum um, and time for professional development and provide adequate staffing to reduce class size. We have started to see classroom bloat, especially at the elementary school level, which makes it even harder for teachers to provide differentiated instruction. Our fourth request is for a non-digital curriculum uh, resources to avoid the health and learning impacts of excessive screen time and to give families the option at the beginning of the school year to use non-digital alternatives, particularly for those who are distracted by screen-based curriculum delivery. And our final request <clears throat> is an invest asking for an investment in transparency in curriculum and data across the board. For the last few years, um, we have been repeatedly stymied in our efforts to see updated curriculum or data on various programs. And the response has been that the MPI office or Office of School Accountability are overwhelmed. The MCPS website has incorrect, outdated information and is not easy to navigate. And MCPS does not provide timely or accessible data or reports. Families can't be partners in their children's education without access to curriculum information or data. And so we would like to see funding and staffing in the appropriate offices in order to address this need. Thank you for this time and for this opportunity to provide our feedback. Thank you. Um, at this time, we're going to take board questions or comments. Uh, if you have a question or comment, please turn your light on. And I will start over on my right this time. I'll let, I'll let Gra Gracie go first. Go Thank you. I just um, 
just very quick, because it, it is a long night. I just wanted to, to thank all the leadership that came out tonight. But I also wanted to thank all the parents. Les quiero dar las gracias a todos los papás que vinieron esta noche a apoyar a la educación de sus hijos, invertir en la educación de sus hijos y en apoyar lo que estamos haciendo. Así que yo les agradezco desde lo más profundo de mi corazón y me alegro verlos. Así que bienvenidos. Siempre pueden venir a testiguar en español como ustedes quieran. So I just wanted to say that they are welcome to come and they can also always testify in Spanish. And we are very happy to have them. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who, who testify, all the leadership from all the groups. We hear you. One of the greatest things that Montgomery County has is so many doers and people who care about the future of our children. And I think that is the common denominator that we all care for the future and what is to come in the next decade and the next generation. So thank you for being here. Ms. Wolf? I, yep. I too want to thank everybody that came out this afternoon. Well, why do I think it's afternoon? <laughs> this evening. <laughs> um, on behalf of our students, I especially want to thank my Soros from Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated for coming out for your continued advocacy on behalf of the black students in Montgomery County. And of course, always we want to thank the Black and Brown Coalition and everyone that came out to talk about the problem that we're having in moving our students, moving the needle on our students. We hear you, we agree with you. We are looking into more evaluation of our programs and we're looking to see that success that you are also looking to see. We have a work session tomorrow. I hope that you will take time and join us and look at it. I think it will help give you some answers about what the proposals are. So again, thank you for coming out. We appreciate your advocacy. Ms. Evans. Sure, so there are eight of us normally, so six, so it's hard to, say something a little bit different, but I will say that I really appreciated hearing from Ms. Clark and Ms. Hatchell Hart coming out to give our community a very detailed description of what PPWs do, right? Not oftentimes do our parents fully understand that role, nor do our students. And I think I heard from our students today, or maybe at our last operating budget hearing, just to kind of you know, get a brief description on um, school psychologists, social workers, PPWs, what they all do. So I appreciate them and just know that we will take into consideration um, to ensure that there is um, appropriate allocation at our schools. Um, and it was great to see our leaders um, of the three unions come out and speak together. And I'm just gonna be honest, because I, I try to do that. Sometimes it's tough to hear your, um, your testimony, but today it was great to hear you say that you will partner with us on our budget, right? Um, and I know when you come out, you speak what's on your heart, so we appreciate that. But just like to hear um, when we can all try to work together on behalf of our students and our staff. And of course, all of our um, nonprofit organizations that come out. I just love that everybody's taking a deep dive into this budget. Budget, um, because it's a lot to digest and to get into, and you all have gotten into it, right? And so I appreciate that. And so just keep asking us the tough questions, right? And um, making certain that we're doing all that we can to ensure that there's equity across the board. Our superintendent, um, so as you heard, we have two more work sessions tomorrow from 10 to 2, so please tune in. And if you can't, because I know you all are working and doing various jobs, you can go back and look at the recording. And then on next Tuesday, the 24th, we'll have a another work session where um, some of your questions that you ask, you should be able to hear that information. If you don't, do as you always do. You email, email us and let us know. Um, just do appreciate everyone taking time to come out and give testimony. Um, as Ms. Savestri says, five minutes, three minutes, it's hard to cut you off, but we have so many here tonight um, wanting to share what they think that should be should be seen in our budget. So we value all of you and um, we have more to hear from. So more people to hear from tonight. And so just thank you all for coming out. Ms. Harris. Yes, um, echoing the comments of all my colleagues. Um, and again, really appreciate the constructive nature of the comments. Um, and a, a couple themes that I did hear. Um, again, looking at how we are communicating and sharing information 
um, with our communities about opportunities, tutoring, that kind of thing. I think that's been a consistent theme. We've been hearing for a while now of uh, families wondering how they can access how they can access tutoring um, and um, and when they've attempted to um, access it, not having success. So how we are um, sharing those opportunities and making sure that we're being vigilant in monitoring the uh, availability. Um, and then heard a lot again tonight about, um, especially in our special programs, uh, how we are following our own policy around um, establishing programs and being clear about their goals, their curricula, how we're monitoring those, um, what data we're collecting and sharing, and then how we're evaluating those programs. And I know we've talked about that a bit, and some of that, um, as so many things did, got derailed by the pandemic. But I think we're looking to get back to kind of keeping our promises to our community and following our policies in that way. Um, hearing a lot about the ELC curriculum and wondering why the plan is to expand to grades four and- Get a little closer. It's Get on. closer. It's on. Is that better? Talk louder. Talk louder. Okay. Sorry. Um, oh, there it is. Um, anyway, um, looking more at uh, heard, hearing significantly about why uh, ELC is being expanded. Um, gratitude that's going to grades four, but wondering about why the not expanding to grade five. And maybe we can talk about that tomorrow. Um, very much appreciate the work of our PPWs. Um, it really is um, invaluable to the success of so many of our students and the resource you provide in your schools is um, greatly appreciated, if not always uh, obviously appreciated. Um, so very much glad to see you all here. Um, and I think that's it for me. Ms. Yang? Okay, I'll try to speak loud. <laughs> all right, thank you so much for all the organizations that uh, come out to testify. Um, my colleague have mentioned several themes, communication, better communication, really elevate all the resources we have, better evaluation, especially the two-way immersion, and also the um, innovative calendar schools um, so that we are better informed. Um, I um, also appreciate the sacrifices and the dedication of our staff. Uh, several positions were specifically mentioned tonight, the CCICs by the students and the PPW coming to uh, share with us their jobs and uh, all the employees in the system. Uh, uh, in the past uh, couple of years, things have not been easy. Now I do want to, um, there are, some things that were a little bit more specific, maybe the staff can help. Uh, we would, one testimony from Oakland Terrace mentioned about that uh, parents are not very clear about alternative options when they come in uh, later than kindergarten. And so maybe that can be something quick and easy that we can update and help. Another thing, um, that was mentioned, I really would like some clarification is uh, about, um, first of all, the tutoring. So in our last work session, um, this is to let everyone know that I have asked to see the utilization ma metrics of uh, our tutoring programs. And uh, maybe during that time, uh, you can help me or other board member, or the public understand what the referral criteria for students to get into the tutoring program, and we will take a look at, you know, whether classroom assessment, district assessment, or do we need to use multiple um, benchmarks uh, in order to help us to uh, make better decisions. Uh, once again, thank you so much uh, for coming out. Our staff are taking detailed uh, notes, and we have heard your comments, and thank you for your advocacy. Um, I also wanted to thank everyone for your very thoughtful and detailed uh, testimony. We do have it in board docs, and I, for one, will be reviewing it because it is a lot uh, of details, and very you all the users uh, of this, these committees, these programs, so it is uh, coming from 
people that are living it day in and day out. So very uh, thankful, uh, grateful for the time that you have taken to write it out and put it so that we can uh, review it. Eh, quería agradecer a todos los que están aquí por el testimonio que se ha dado esta noche. Todo ha sido muy detallado, muy bien planeado. Así que yo voy a regresar a ese testimonio y estudiarlo muy bien porque ustedes son los usuarios, los que los, viven estas prácticas todos los días en las escuelas. Así que quiero asegurarme que lo voy a entender bien. Uh, just let me, um, so a lot to process tonight, but um, Dr. McKnight, as my colleagues have said, you know, the, um, in our work sessions, um, just to give people a little bit more guidance in terms of what's coming up next, the accelerators will be covered in our final work session. And I think you've heard from the board that there's interest in hearing uh, data on effectiveness. So we're, we're, we want to support the budget, we want to support these accelerators, we want to know that these uh, programs are working before we, we move forward. And also something that's very challenging is the budget is a, a, a window in time, this year. So sometimes we hear, well, you didn't fund the Grow Your Own program. It's very important to all the board members. Well, actually, that was funded two years ago. And so it's hard to give people kind of a, a, a holistic picture of the priorities, what's being funded, maybe not this year because it was funded last year, or it makes more sense to fund it next year. And so that's a challenge that um, we deal with every year. I know we're developing a program budget um, that will be available later this year to help us better understand the themes that we talk about um, in the school system rather than just a chapter by chapter analysis of our, our budget. Um, but I think people, what I'm hearing is people want to hear a plan of action for improving our literacy and math for our students. You developed that plan with the two and a half year plan after we reopened school buildings. And I know for me that really resonated and I think that's something that um, I think it's, it's time to develop kind of the, to show the public there is a plan. It's just hard to discern from all the chapters in the budget and everything that's going on in MCPS. That's my comment and I know Ms. Wolf has more. Do you want oh, thank you. Uh, President Silvestri, I want to thank everybody for coming out as well. The testimony and the, the questions and the uh, recommendations are really helpful as we think about how these investments end up being um, an experience that whether it's students or parents or whomever may have on the other end of that. Ms. Silvestri was absolutely right in what she said. In listening to a lot of the comments after the budget release and some of the questions that even come up tonight. I, I believe that it's gonna be very helpful for us to present the budget, probably more so in a three-year perspective. Last year we came forward, I get my years mixed up, excuse me, from COVID-19, but <laughs> it was the year after, or I think it was the winter after COVID. One way or another we said, there are five areas that we're gonna to continue to focus on in MCPS for the next, we were saying two and a half, it really is three years that we know are gonna be areas in which we invest accelerators in and address funding in that will help us move forward as a result of all of the impact from the pandemic. And we've done that. As we look at the budget though, as Ms. Silvestri said, each year you're building. It's almost like a building block. While we're here talking about what we're funding for this year, if you were to ask me, what do we fund that's in place for this year that's supporting math and literacy, I can say we invested in putting a reading specialist in every single elementary school to help students uh, to get the support needed within the school to help students with literacy. Last year, right, that was last year. We also put a staff development teacher in the building knowing that for many, at that point years, our staff had really been focused on operational needs as a result of COVID-19, and we needed to reset to get everybody focused on equitable teaching and learning so that all children in the school system can learn. Tutoring, um, I would say that was something that we added on as an intervention to support. While those investments were focused on, we want the quality of instruction in the classroom to be focused, we are adding, adding tutoring as a, um, you know, as a support structure. That can also accelerate for students who, who want to utilize it in that way. Um, so when you think about this year, 
those things are already in place. This year, we're, built, we're building on them. When we think about students and their learning, research says students need more time. They just need more time for learning to revisit, to reinforce all of the things that were uh, taught to them during the past couple of years. So when we think about um, extended school year and extending the schools that we do that um, in Montgomery County, that's a start to that, in addition to a number of many other programs. Um, so I just share that with you, and, and the thought will be that continue to watch our next few work sessions, because we are going to present the building block so that you can see how last year builds on this year, and this year will build on what I can even already project will be some things that we have to do next year. And literally using data to, uh, to, project, some of, to, to project all of that. Um, and then the comments around the data um, in the program evaluation were real. And I will tell you, we have to know why we're doing what we're doing. We just can't dream it because we got 161,000 students that are expecting us to do the right thing when it comes down to identifying their needs. So data does have to drive that. We are now resetting to get back to our reports because quite frankly, if we presented program evaluations over the last two years, it would have been limited. Any of you who are very familiar with how we utilize research, COVID-19 is a limiting factor right there um, because the conditions can't even be compared to what they were before because of what we're experiencing. But we have committed to make sure that we, uh, now that we are thankfully in the space of a um, consistent controlled environment for schooling, now we are returning to our regular um, program evaluations as we should um, because we want to present good, real, valid data as we're looking at uh, all of the things that we put in place for our students. So I share that with you because I also want you to know what's coming in response to a lot of what you presented this evening. And again, I wanna thank our students. You all just amaze me every single time you come and show us what you do because we know that one day you will replace all of us um, who are here and what a, what a, what a, what a great um, opportunity to see that and to our staff who um, I know you have been working all day just like us and to still have the energy to come tonight. <laughs> and present, we appreciate it. And to our parents and advocacy groups, we're gonna to continue to work with you because um, all of what we are sharing tonight means the school system alone can't do this. It is through partnership that we will be able to accomplish it successfully. So I just wanna thank you for that in case any of you leave during the break. Just wanted to share that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Ms. Wolf. I just wanted to say that our budget is really considering need versus per, pu per pupil funding this year. But I also want to say it's very important that we have your support when we go to the county council. So that's, that's really what I wanted to say, that for all of you, brush off that testimony and come up there and support us because we really have asked for what we needed, but it is always at the bare minimum of what we need. So any support you can give to help us get this increase at the county council also will be greatly appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are going to take a 10-minute break. My phone says it's 740, so we will reconvene at 750. Thank you.
honored to testify on behalf of the Walter Johnson Cluster of PTAs. We appreciate this opportunity to provide feedback about the most pressing needs that our nine schools are currently facing. As you've heard for many years now, overcrowding at Walter Johnson High School and the challenges of running large schools amid the continuing difficulties caused by the COVID pandemic are the foremost issues facing our cluster right now. We continue to see our children dealing with fallout from the disruptions of 2020 and 2021 and the losses they suffered in that time. Being able to meet students' needs ultimately comes down to staffing having enough adults in the building to cover absences, handle emergencies, and provide the instruction, connection, and guidance that each student needs. So with respect to having enough adults in the building, um, we have some areas uh, specifically that we would urge the board to consider prioritizing and looking at. Um, Availability of substitute teachers and paraeducators. Obviously, this is um, a, a significant need across the county that certainly we've been hearing a lot about in recent months. Availability of substitute teachers is a pressing problem throughout the county. The inability to fill needed substitute jobs places additional stresses and burdens on teachers and administrators who are already stretched thin. Some larger schools at all levels, including elementary, would benefit from having a full-time substitute teacher or paraeducator assigned to their schools. Large schools need substitutes regularly, and having an additional adult who knows the school, procedures, students, and staff brings added value beyond that which one day substitute staffing can provide. Recess and lunch monitors are always an issue for our elementary schools and continue to be at this time when um, behavior and students' reactions are still in part uh, influenced by their experiences during the pandemic and having been out of school um, for a, a significant period of time. Obviously, we want every child to have a safe experience at school, including during lunch and recess. Yet with multiple grade levels sharing lunch and recess time, there is a need for for more lunch and recess monitors to ensure that the kids have adult supervision and adults they can go to um, on the playground and in the lunchroom. Um, third, special education resources and permanent paraeducators. Elementary schools are in need of additional special education support, both from teachers and from permanent paraeducator allocations. When temporary part-time paraeducators are assigned to students with high needs, often one-on-one, -on -one, these individuals are usually looking for permanent positions. And in a tight job market like we have right now, they are often find them. Um, and when they do, they will live, leave mid-year or even after only a few weeks when they secure that permanent position. As we know, children thrive and learn um, in the context of relationships, and a constantly changing cast of temporary part-time paraeducators cannot serve the children as efficaciously as a person who stays long-term and forms a relationship with that child and the child's teachers. Um, I'd also like briefly to hit on a, a including substitute teacher availability and general and special education paraeducator support. Our schools have strong teams to utilize and utilize creative staffing strategies daily to meet their student and classroom requirements. We commend them for their her Herculean efforts, but our appreciation does not solve the problem. Our principals and administrative staff cover lunch and recess every day due to inadequate staffing allotments. Paraeducators are the de facto full-time classroom substitutes due to a shortage of substitute teachers. Special education paraeducators and special teachers regularly piece together coverage that um, coverage holes in their schools. This minimal level of support staff and lack of available substitutes significantly impacts our teachers and staff's ability to do what they're trained and hired to do. By covering lunch, recess, and classroom teachers, our school staff lose instructional planning and hinders their ability to address the educational and social emotional needs of their students. We also lose general education support hours, which our students greatly need to recover learning losses and to ensure that they meet MCPS goals of being college, career, and community ready. We respectfully request MCPS and the board increase paraeducator and support staff across the board to account for increased student needs and pro programmatic enrollment and to ensure student well-being and safety. 
Number two, special education. Since September, one, student, one school has almost doubled the number of special education service hours provided from 180 to 300 hours. Despite the incredible increased student need, they have received no additional staffing and we're covering these additional hours with existing staff. Another school has twice the number of students with 504 plans as most other schools. Each of our cluster schools do not have sufficient staff to meet the needs of our special education students and often pull general education paraeducators from the duties to fill in the special education needs. Without the necessary support staff in our schools, we cannot ensure that all the students are prepared to thrive to be college, career, and community ready. We respectfully request that MCPS and the board prioritize hiring additional special education teachers and paraeducators and increase special education staffing across all of our schools in the county. We also request additional support in terms of staffing and stipends for the devel development, implementation, and monitoring of student 504 plans. Number three, mental health. The pandemic and our recovery continues to take a toll on the social, emotional, and mental health of our community. Our cluster schools have shared share that the student's self-regulation continues to be an issue and requires considerable staff time and resources. In her September 2022 report on mental health and well-being, Dr. Knight noted that in addition to the social workers assigned to work directly with high schools, there are seven social workers in the central office who can provide se um, services to elementary and middle schools as well, as 15 social workers interns who will work with the school system through a partnership with the University of Maryland. And while we appreciate the bridge to wellness centers and the hiring of one social worker per high school, it barely scratches the surface of mental health needs of our schools. If every child in MCPS required access to mental health services, each existing social worker or intern would have a caseload of more than 3,300 students. This is an untenable situation. We res request, um, respectfully request MCPS and the board prioritize hiring social workers to support the well-being and mental health of our students. In addition, we emphasize that MCPS should continue to fund increasing staff for counseling and psych colleges positions and request that these positions be allotted across all our schools. We strongly urge the board to adopt and implement the fiscal year 2024 budget that is cognizant of immediately addressing these needs. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we will hear from Kathy Fusto. Good evening, Board of Education and Superintendent McKnight. I'm Kathy Fusto, representing the Seneca Valley Cluster, which includes the soon to be open Clarksburg Elementary School number nine. Thank you, Dr. McKnight, for the robust budget that we all hope gets fully funded. Aligning with the four Board of Education priorities, our comments are as followed. Build a safe and inclusive school climate. This priority speaks to the culture and climate literally, needed for success. Happy to see additional HVAC technicians listed. Athletic trainers at every high school is a total win. And we wouldn't mind every student and staff getting a CPR and AED refresher every year. The bus tracking app gets us up to speed and flipping the fleet from diesel to electric is a much needed jolt to the system. What's missing? Well. We need an LGBTQ coordinator. This work intersects curriculum, counseling, bullying, athletics, even representation and book choice. Let's join our neighbors like Howard County Public School and DCPS that have dedicated staff to coordinate initiatives. Please also restore the Equity Innovation Fund. This line item made it into the last budget but was halted by the global pandemic. Part of this initiative uh, innovation fund was equity money directly available to hire farm schools for purchases that wealthy communities easily make. While MCPS uses an equity lens, the lived experiences of students differ significantly due to parent funding. The equity innovation fund gave access to school communities through an application for items that are typically funded by parents such as logo canopies, cultural arts assemblies, stadium entrances, senior swag bags, even staff appreciation events, all contributing to an unbalanced public school scenario. 
the Equity Innovation Fund can be and should be restored. Improve math and literacy rates. Pre-K to close the gap before it even starts is the way to go. Adding preschool to get a strong math and reading foundation is an incredibly important component. The positions in the budget are exciting to see, and we look forward to hearing the very littlest learners sing their ABCs all the way to the cafeteria for lunch. Universal lunch is the best way for every student to get the meal they need, which of course impacts academics, but also mental health, physical health, attention span, and energy level. Let's dig in for more lunch funding, like we did for AP and IB test fees. Improve retention and recruitment. To retain and recruit amazing staff, let's do some reflection. There is the business side of this job. Is the pay where it needs to be? Is the curriculum current and comprehensive? Are there enough materials and supplies? Is this consistent across the content areas? How do we know what is needed from each teacher, content area, school? Take a look at fine arts if you want to see where we have gaps in staffing and materials. Then there is the feelings part of being a teacher or staff member. Do teachers feel valued, respected, welcomed? A diverse staff, including people from all walks of life, so that students can see themselves and really feel seen and heard. How do we know that we are meeting this vital need in today's very stressful educational environment? Support two-way communication. The 14th largest public school system in the nation, one with high expectations, needs a committed plan for information distribution. The bus tracking app is an example of simple, clear use of technology that has high impacts for families, students, and staff. The Student Strong app, clear, simple, use of technology to get crucial, crucial information out. Positions in the communications and technology departments can perhaps get creative with use of apps to address the getting a drink from a fire hose. When it comes to trying to keep up with important information, everyone is happy to get the info they need quickly. We appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Hopefully this board hasn't been Board. We are a cluster full of amazing students, loving parents, and committed teachers, and we need a huge investment in our almost 8,000 students. I have to say before I start, I get a little uncomfortable representing our cluster as a white woman, as I am not the majority here, and I do not want to speak for anyone. My goal is to represent our community faithfully in the hope that this testimony will reflect the learnings from four years in this role of listening to parents and the greater community. The MCPS anti-racist audit was conducted with a view to address racism in our county. One of the key observations of the audit report was that, quote, that community members of color had consistently lower rates of satisfaction. Overall, students, families, and staff of color reported having a less satisfactory experience with MCPS than other members of the community, end quote. If I'm doing my math right, on the MCPS homepage, the demographics pie chart says our county is 75.6% students of color. Does this mean 70 75.6% of our students and families are having a less satisfactory experience. The Gaysburg cluster has 11 schools. 10 schools are 85% students of color. Does this mean over 85% of our families in the Gaithersburg cluster are having a less satisfactory experience? Gaithersburg High School is one of eight high schools out of the 26 high schools in MCPS that has a higher than 50% farm rate. We would like to urge MCPS to make these eight schools a priority. Our cluster of 8,000 MCPS students is not thriving as a whole. We need your help and support to access high quality education. We are requesting our cluster be a priority because we are a part of the structure that has not working for us as clearly identified by the MCPS anti-racist audit report. Our cluster with its particular demographics is exactly who you say you want to reach, right? Dr. Midnight, Ms. Silvestri, Board of Ed members, 
We are counting on you to work with us to identify our needs and take the action that is necessary to provide true equity. It's a new path. It's not going to be what it always has been. You know that because if it is what has always been, it would not be enough. The challenge is what does true equity look like when MCPS crafts and approves the operating budget? We can and should be at the cutting edge of what it looks like to support black and brown students, diverse school communities, school communities with complicated socioeconomic needs. MCPS can provide access to high quality education for our students if it takes a long, hard look at this operating budget. It makes our cluster a priority. We are trusting you to do this for us and the greater Montgomery County community. Now, the results won't equal um an equal allocation in resources across the schools. However, it will be equitable. To this end, we may need a little bit more money than other clusters. We may need a little bit more support, and this is how equity is achieved, and we are trusting that you lead the way with this effort. As a cluster, we face a variety of challenges when it comes to assessing educational achievement enrichment for our students via clubs, programs, field trips, celebrations, sport even events, AP testing fees, buses to allow our students to participate in educational opportunities and much more. Most of these types of events are not in the operate, operating budget. They are in the independent activity fund issues. As you know, the I, IAF um, is funded by individual school fundraising. Our cluster cannot fundraise at the rate that is needed to support our schools in these kinds of basic schools operating needs. Schools receive donations and commissions for, for the IF from a variety of sources, including PTA, that contributes to the huge inequities of our county. After learning about our Davisburg cluster and being an alum from the cluster, I noticed that the system of funding activities is inequitable in our cluster. We may need a little bit more support for this reason. We want a partnership, we need a little bit more attention and a little bit more financial partnership from um, for, uh, for our cluster. Let me be clear, we have a great group of elementary, middle school and high school students. We have a great, um, families who are truly committed to the education of all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Hannah Donart. Son? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me here tonight, for all of us here tonight. It's nice to meet you in person for the first time. Um, I'm Hannah Donnert. I'm here today to testify as a postal cluster coordinator, as well as the chair of the MCCPTA Health and Wellness Committee. Um, I am also, I'll start first with the cluster comments, and then I'll move on quickly to our committee comments. So our cluster thanks you for prioritizing construction of the new high school that's underway. Um, we're excited to have this project underway and along, along with the new gym expansion. Thank you for listening to us on that. Um, however, parents and students have raised some concerns having to do with an active co school co-located on the construction site. The buildings being torn down are old and contain many legacy contaminants like lead and asbestos that pose health hazards to our students and staff. Students are, have shared stories of ceiling tiles falling down on their heads during class, walking through flooded or outdoor corridors, mold growing in the few bathrooms they have access to, construction noise distracting them from instruction and testing, and more. These are firsthand accounts from students I've spoken to. To create a safer environment more conducive to learning, our community is requesting increased maintenance and upkeep as the, as the high school is not a normally functioning facility. We would also like to request environmental quality controls, including more portable HIPAA filters, ongoing indoor air quality monitoring for CO2 and other harmful contaminants like mold, in addition to mitigating where needed. Our cluster is also urging the board and MCPS to fully fund staffing for a wellness center in Poolsville. We would like to know, and we'd also like to know when the funding is slated for staffing in the coming year, if it is. Um, We've heard of success stories of wellness centers in Seneca Valley, transforming school cultures, offering much needed mental health resources and a safe place for many students and staff. Due to our remote location, more equitable access to criti is critical as far as we are far from medical facilities that provide many of these resources. So the rest of this, these comments are devoted now to our 
committee. Um, I would just like to uh, mention district wide that we're advocating here. We put a list of committee recommendations together that would go a long way towards supporting our children's academic progress. As we've, le as we've learned throughout the pandemic is directly linked to their physical, mental and emotional well-being. First is nutrition. I'm going to echo the same thing that's been said before, but we are still continuously advocating to provide universal, healthy, relevant, culturally relevant meals to all students. It worked during the pandemic and we want it to continue. We hear it loud and clear from parents all over the district. Next, mental health and substance use prevention. We appreciate current county efforts to strengthen access to student health and mental health services in every school, with the MCPS Bridge to Wellness program being a great start. However, implementation is moving far more slowly in some clusters than others. Therefore, we re recommend funding an audit and ongoing assessment of services being provided using required and novel data collection to assess needs, needs and gaps. Funding engagement activities and listening sessions is also another great way to go to gather input from students directly, staff and caregivers about the effectiveness of such programs like Leader and Me, haven't heard good things, I have to put it out there, and programs before further investing. Continue to facilitate coordinated communication between DHHS and MCPS to maximize our resources and more fully integrate the wraparound model into our schools. What's working we want more of. We also applaud MCPS for bringing school social workers into more schools. To build upon this, we recommend social workers or access to them at every school. Not all schools have them. Uh, so then on to support further promotion for school-based physical and mental health services that are easy to access and available on demand, such as trauma-informed care, handle with care, and youth mental health first aid for all staff and students to be trained in. Also putting Narcan in every AED and bleed kits in every building and throughout buildings. Sometimes they're not accessible in a building. Our committee supports the Surgeon General's recommendation as well for schools to implement later start times before secondary, for secondary, for secondary students. In order to do this, we recommend funding a transportation study to identify any impediments to allowing our students to arrive at school with a safe and healthy bell time. For environmental health, last, last committee here, subcommittee, as part of our school profile, we're also asking that, that the district provide a dashboard that includes indoor air quality and water quality metrics with up-to-date test results and maintenance plans for all schools. I've included more details in my written testimony. Thank you so much for listening and for the late night. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Laura Stewart. Good evening, my name is Laura Stewart and I'm here tonight speaking for the Einstein Cluster and as the Down County Consortium Area Vice President. This is my last time speaking here on a proposed MCPS budget as a current MCPS parent. Even with very different experiences, my children have benefited from MCPS's tireless effort to educate our youth, mostly because of stellar teachers and counselors who took time to really understand my children's needs. But there were bumps along the way. We could have used more access to psychologists and mental health professionals and a better social emotional learning curriculum. And this is what I hear from students from all over the system. In order for all children to reach their potential, we need teachers and staff to have the ability to connect meaningfully with each student. Unfortunately, too many students still slip through the cracks. And we need to fill those cracks with universal meals and, like I said, more mental health services. This operating budgets need to reflect our children's need in an equi equitable way. Before I talk about the Einstein Cluster, Loiterman Middle, Middle School has asked for a mechanical service technician. They have specialized multimedia technology and they need support that includes training staff, students, and community users on its proper use. The program depends on this technology working correctly and they've had some issues. Einstein High School struggled with staffing this year. We thank MCPS for working through a difficult situation in our math program. This staffing issue is a problem throughout the system and highlights a, poss a possible systemic issue in the way MCPS hires. Three areas could be addressed in our budget. 
Firstly, are salaries truly competitive? And can we look at retention bonuses so that we don't lose talent? Secondly, are we recruiting effectively? Have we heard that we have heard that well-connected parents helped recruit long-term subs? Is there a need to add staff to our HR department in order to employ more recruitment strategies so that parents don't have to um, step in? Thirdly, can we be more efficient in hiring talent? We've heard that our hiring process takes longer than neighboring jurisdictions. Analyzing our HR practices and investing in HR could be a way forward. We support an increase in central office staffing for development and implementation of 504 plans. 504 plans are more popular than ever, especially since COVID had hit our kids so hard. We do not support special program expansion absent of adequate assessment data and staffing of programs currently in place. For instance, Einstein has an IB program which may not be fully staffed due to the math teacher shortage. Similarly, dual enrollment programs should um, not be used as a replacement for hiring qualified advanced math teachers at NPS schools. Oakland Terrace has two-way emerging program which you've heard about, and there are concerns there which may, which may eclipse benefits uh, before we replicate the program. Similar, similarly, we want to see the ELC implemented at more elementary schools, but there are significant mismatches in class size indicating a need for increased staffing and ensuring all students are getting the benefits of the program, including students with learning differences who qualify. At Einstein, classes are massive, especially for students in the English language development program. There are not enough teachers or rooms in the building to accommodate the level of need that many students have. In previous years, students entered high school with basic levels of English. Einstein now has 900 students who have gone through the ELD program with several hundred who are still actively receiving ELD services. All the schools in the Einstein clusters need to incentivize Spanish-speaking administrators and teachers. The population of Spanish-speaking families have grown, but there are few administrators who actually speak Spanish. I also need to point out a couple maintenance issues quickly. Um, Einstein seems to have some problems with their HVAC, so we could use those HVAC techs to help um, there are issues with ceiling tiles and dampness in rooms. And we also support the IUQ monitoring. And um, the zeolite field, Einstein, no longer contains any zeolite. It's incredibly hard. And there's only sand as the surface. Thank so you. we need to maintain the field. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Jen Swain. Thank you for leaving this on, on, Laura, because I never get this right. <laughs> Ready? Yes. Okay. Good evening. I'm Jen Sawin. I'm the parent of a 2021 Northwood graduate. I've already exited my last child from the MCPS some time ago. I'm pleased to present comments on the operating budget from the Northwood cluster. Some have called this recommended budget a big ask, and respectfully, we disagree. We agree that this funding is an investment. In real dollars, we invest less in a child today than we did when my college sophomore and, and yours and yours uh, entered kindergarten. It is not a big ask to just keep pace. We thank you for prioritizing safety and we have a few specific safety related requests. At Sims, Silver Spring International Middle School, we need a third security assistant Please push the head count from 81 to 82 in FY24. The gym at Sims is down the block from the school building on Wayne Avenue. It's not attached. It's down the hill. It's near the public bus stop. All day, the middle schoolers are walking between the school and their gym classes. The uncovered path is roughly equivalent to four flights of stairs, plus an additional 67 yards, and yes, I pasted it off last night. Phys ed teachers currently do the security work. They leave the building to monitor students as they walk 
back and forth. If a child is late, the teacher must again step outside and monitor the student as they walk. And this cuts into instructional time. Now, Wayne Avenue is under construction for the Purple Line. I visited the site last night, again, to see the calm before the storm drain because a new 18-month traffic disruption is slated to begin this very week. The storm drain system, the curbs, the sidewalks, they're all coming out to be replaced. Now, hazards inherent to a school site are not listed factors for allocating security assistance to a middle school, plausibly because a school campus should not be inherently hazardous. Um, but Sims deserves special consideration here for FY24. And we ask you to consider even whether anything can be done for student safety this year. The construction also impairs drop-off, pickup, and parking at both Sims and Sligo Creek Elementary because they share the site. Please address this as soon as possible, either through the budget or by coordinating better with Montgomery County Police for traffic control. Northwood High School needs additional security cameras and lighting for its 14 learning cottages. Placement of the relocatables obstruct safety monitoring of the area and the walkways. Blind spots plus insufficient lighting add up to a security risk. In a wider scope, we suggest adding a dedicated support position for our cluster or district-wide to help families navigate preventative measures around substance use and treatment options through Dr. Kapunin's office. A liaison can foster positive communications and relationships with families in their most challenging circumstances. We are so grateful for all the hours Dr. Potter and Ms. Izard have put in, coordinating with the community. And we believe this crisis really merits a dedicated family liaison. They actually presented at Northwood's PTSA meeting this evening. So, Northwood is embarking on new adventures. Thank you for budgeting support services and clerical overtime for relocation as we plan our move to Woodward. Please also ensure adequate funding for any other moving expenses and any furniture or materials that are not already covered by the Woodward project. As we launch our new Amharic class, we need professional development and summer hours to support a future Amharic teacher with curriculum development. We need some extra support for our English language learners and their families. We have two specific staffing requests. Those are in our written testimony. Forrest Knowles needs more resources to replace the Chromebooks because they're failing or they can't hold a charge and it's a constant struggle over there. Finally, we question some recommended cuts and we question them so much that we actually hope we've misread the tables in the budget. There seems to be a net reduction of $750,000 for subs in schools. Teachers are already stretched. This is the wrong time to cut subs. The budget holds steady the number of bus drivers and has a net reduction of $300,000 for substitute drivers. We're not sure this is the right moment for that. We'd ad we've advocated for possible solutions to the driver crunch, including more robust and creative co uh, coordination with the police for crossing guards instead of hazard buses, and for students to ride the public buses, for example, crossing University Boulevard to pick up the ride on Route 9 or the Metro Bus C2. Thank you very much. Thank you. Up next, we have a video uh, by Kathy Stocker. Dear President, Silvestri, Board of Education members, and Superintendent McKnight, Thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony regarding the MCPS FY 2024 operating budget. My name is Kathy Stocker and along with my fellow BCC cluster coordinator, Beth Van Gelder, we welcome this opportunity. We understand that inflationary forces and current enrollment numbers pose budgetary constraints in an era when post pandemic needs require more resources and not fewer. The superintendent has presented a thoughtful budget and we want to emphasize our support for and excitement about some of the accelerators and urge caution and share concerns about some of the other proposed initiatives. We support the investment in a bus tracking system. The system promises tracking benefits for current users and will provide important route timing and utilization data for families. While these easily apparent benefits alone warrant the investment, we urge you to also use the tracking system generated data to finally take decisive action on what we know will be a game changer for our high school students, later school start times. With the implementation of the tracking system, we will have the transportation data. So what we will no longer have is an excuse to keep postponing or sublimating an obviously beneficial strategy for improving student well-being. 
as the home cluster for BCC High School, where the BCC High School Educational Foundation originated and incubated the College Tracks program, we heartily endorse the expansion of College Tracks throughout the county. We have seen firsthand that this program changes lives and has a proven track record. Please fully fund the expansion and access to this excellent program. I know that I risk becoming a broken record when I urge you to build in some budgetary slack when it comes to forecasting ESOL and special needs in our rapidly growing elementary schools. In our cluster, and especially at Bethesda Elementary, our needs always exceed the forecast and always grow throughout the year. The need for ESOL services has increased dramatically as more immigrants and refugees have been settled in our cluster. Before 2020, there was a large ESOL population, but there was a more even distribution of students in the various levels of English. Because of the pandemic and the linguistic isolation of virtual learning, a far higher percentage of our ESOL kids are now at the lower end of English proficiency. The increased need of our students is straining resources and stretching our teachers and administrators past their limit. We want to close by commenting on the proposed accelerator for tutoring services. We understand that intensive one-on-one -on -one tutoring can be beneficial to students, but we are really concerned about prioritizing millions of dollars for tutoring. How equitable is the access to these tutoring services? Elementary age students must rely on family members who are able to manage and schedule pre and post school tutoring. High school students who must go to work after school cannot access these tutoring sessions. And is this tutoring really diagnosing where the learning gaps are for each individual student? If there is so much need for tutoring, should we not be addressing these pedagogical needs in the classroom? We are hearing from too many parents and students who are feeling crushed by the expectation that tutoring is supposed to be the panacea for all the missed time and learning loss during the pandemic. We need less tutoring, not more. What we do need is more tailored instruction and better student teacher ratios in our classrooms and during our school days. And we need more support from curricular and learning experts within MCPS. The BCC High School PTSA administered a survey for students and parents about math at our high school. The feedback was alarming. One student reported that she does her homework with a garbage can by her desk because she is so anxious about her work that she just throws up while doing her homework. This is not a student who just blew off math for a year and a half. This is a student who did not learn everything she needed to learn to progress in the subject through no fault of her own and through no fault of any teacher or administrator. This was just one of many, many alarming stories. I hear from other parents whose kids are having to give up important extracurriculars in order to meet with tutors every day. These kids need more involvement with their friends and in activities that bring them joy and a mental break. Let's spend the money on helping our teachers and students in the classroom and during the school day. Thank you all for your service to our students and their families during this time of rebuilding and rehabilitation. We applaud the superintendent's careful consideration of all students and especially those who face the most needs coming out of pandemic. Precisely because we must do more with less, we urge very careful consideration about how these specific budgetary initiatives are deployed, monitored, and measured. We have added additional comments in our submitted written testimony. We agree that it is important to fully fund the proposed budget, but urge careful consideration for which programs will actually move the needle when it comes to helping our kids and families heal from the pandemic and thrive moving forward. As always, thank you all for your tireless service and profound dedication to the well-being of our students and families. To you and yours, stay well and all the best. Thank you. Thank you to all our cluster representatives who provided testimony here tonight. We are now going to pause to take comments or questions from our board. And I will start with Ms. Yang. Thank you so much for the cluster coordinators who come out and well, I know that you have a full day and it's getting late, so really grateful. Um, there are some common themes, a lot of about our staffing, about bus driver, paraeducator, substitute teacher, and these are the things in our future work sessions we will take a closer look. Um, I do want to follow up with the Poolsville Clusters comment about some of the uh, safety uh, issues in the building about ceiling tiles falling and stuff. So we might want to take a look so to ensure the safety of our students. I will let our my colleagues to ask further questions. Thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, just a couple things I saw. I heard um, some themes again. Um, definitely appreciate MCCPTA support for universal meals and high quality fresh 
culturally responsive meals. Um, and I also appreciate highlighting the work that uh, Dr. Kapunin is doing around substance use prevention and um, much work to be done there. A lot of students are also speaking to those issues. So and I know there's an event coming up on the 28th in Clarksburg, um, but that is definitely an area of focus um, that is a real crisis that's impacting our students. And finally, I just want to say I appreciate um, MCCC PTA support for our work on inclusion. Thank you. Ms. Evans? Um, so thank you, uh, Ms. Silvestri, um, and thank you to everyone who's spoken on this. We're, we're on the fifth portion, cluster representatives. I think the what stood out most to me, if we could um, talk about this um, a little later, is um, the purple line, right? And what we heard around the um, construction that will be going on and having local police is not a part of MCPS, but it's obviously discussions that we can have. But so I'll take that up with staff and just kind of ask some questions about that. But that has been um, something that we have been keeping a careful watch on ever since um, they began construction. I remember at one point when um, County Executive Ike Leggett was the county executive that we had someone from his office come out to speak to us about some of the impacts that would have on our schools, in particular Sims. So just thank you for just going out there, I heard you say last night, um, and bringing your testimony to the forefront. But it's not, it's, we very, we're very much aware of it, but um, we'll definitely keep a close eye. So thank you. Ms. Wolf. Uh, my comment was also about the testimony on the purple line I guess I was a little bit concerned that they're tearing up all the sidewalks and everything. How are we going to ensure the safety of our students that are walking through there? I don't know if someone is able to go out and figure out um, or assess the situation and get back to us on how we're going to be able to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we will go tomorrow and take a look. We'll send our transportation team as well as our security. Um, we will also communicate with our police partners in terms of a possible need that's there, but please allow us an opportunity to visit and follow up with the board. Thank you. Ms. Roberta Oven. Um, uh, thank you, uh, President Sylvester. I, um, I just want to say that it moves me um, as somebody who, who worked very closely with my uh, cluster coordinator, the, the amount of hours <laughs> that go into doing this work. I just want to commend you ladies. Um, I think uh, Ms. Fusto gets the award for the most animated and uh, just engaging uh, testimony. Um, I really like uh, her comment on the coordinator for LGBTQ um, students uh, for, um, for MCPS. Um, but I, I keep seeing a, a common theme uh, with support for uh, ESOL students across the board, not just down county, but we heard from Bethesda, we heard, you know, even uh, from Poolsville and so on. Um, and I have to tell you, as a former ESOL student, the support that you get from an ESOL teacher is irreplaceable. I would not be here today if it wasn't for the fact that I had an amazing ESOL teacher who back then, you know, I, I, was, I was just so lucky and blessed um, that I, there was not hundreds of other students in my school there, which is very few of us, I guess it's for high school, mm -hmm. which now, you know, is a majority uh, minority school and one of the highest farm schools. And I just want to say to my, my Gaysis for high school folks that uh, thank you so much for being such an ally. Um, please don't ever apologize for doing the right thing for kids. I think all of us are here to do that. Um, and I just want to say that I think we really need to kind of look again at the great need of students coming into our system um, from refugees to others who are going to need that support and to ensure that we do have the staff. And I did, you know, have some questions about the number of, um, of teachers that we were devoting to um, for, for the next year to ensure that um, in the Clarksburg cluster as well, and others that we do have that support. And in Poolsville, I know that 
for the last couple of years, I've been advocating for a wellness center, health center, which is going to happen. And uh, so that's coming, right? Uh, because we know that one of the things that the pandemic, one of the things that has left us is it has shown us the inequities that you know existed pre-pandemic that we are now able to focus on and be able to do something about it. So to all the cluster uh, moms, thank you so much for, um, for your valuable work. And also the Sim School is not in my district, but it concerns me a little bit, that gym, um, because in inclement weather, I don't know how that is handled, but it, it sounds pretty, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I just had one question since uh, Ms. Sawin, Sawin brought it up about the reduction in substitutes. Can someone just quickly clarify, is that a real reduction or why does it appear that way in, in the budget? Um, for, this is for the substitute bus drivers or the substitute teachers? Teachers. So I'll address the bus drivers first. Um, so uh, what, the team has done a lot of work this year, collapsing routes, reducing the number of routes that we have on the road. And so, and we also have a, a large, very large pool of um, vacant um, subs. And so it's just adjusting to what the new need is, which is still filling a bunch of sub positions. So we are still looking for bus drivers and we are uh, interested in hiring any uh, good drivers that people know of, so please uh, don't hesitate to recommend them over our way. We still have many, many unfilled positions uh, that we're looking to fill. This was just a bit of an adjustment to the new reality of, of where we sit. Um, and then I will ask Dr. Marks to address the, um, the substitute teacher positions. I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, quite sure, so I will get back to you in terms of uh, clarification, but I, again, I think it's similar in that we fill our sub-positions and then at the end of the year, we don't have people who, who um, continue to sub and then we fill them up again. But um, I really need to uh, go in and, and check that because I don't think it came out of my office in terms of that. Thank you. Okay, we can continue uh, with uh, the testimony from individuals. And up next, we can uh, hear from Daniela Helton. Okay, good evening, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. My name is Daniela Helton, and I'm an elementary school counselor at Little Bennett. Here are five things to know as to why elementary school counselors feel invisible. Number one, middle and high school counselors have smaller student to counselor ratios that average 250 students to one counselor. These secondary levels get this ratio regardless of their farm status. In elementary school, we have large ratios that average 500 students or more to one counselor. And additional counselors are given to schools based on economic needs first. Secondary schools have resource counselors who are the head of the department. These counselors get a stipend. All elementary school counselors are the head of their department and do not get a stipend. Number two, secondary counselors have a counseling secretary. Elementary school counselors do not. We have to manage all the 504 plans. In addition, we do not have a secretary who is given extra TPT time to help support the 504 process. Number three, middle and high schools have security officers as well as large counseling departments. Elementary schools do not. We help with the security and respond to mental health and dangerous crises, leaving many counselors concerned for their safety getting hurt, and having to take leave due to injury. Likewise, every high school has a wellness center with an assigned social worker. Elementary schools do not have access to this. Number four, 
There are currently five elementary school counselors who have a National Board Certification Teaching Certificate under the subject area of school counseling in MCPS, yet none of them are receiving the blueprint salary increase. The counselors have engaged in the appeal process and were denied the salary increase. Along with the support of their administrators, these counselors were able to prove they are co-teachers and provide students with direct service for more than 60% of the day. These counselors demonstrated that they implement direct individual counseling, group counseling, and classroom guidance lessons, and teach the health and learning skills standards during their various forms of instruction. And number five, School counselors are being excluded from engaging in the professional learning opportunities. For years, MCPS educators have been able to apply for a scholarship in order to pursue the NBCT process. This year, for the first time, school counselors are no longer eligible to get the scholarship support to pursue this advanced certificate. There are 135 elementary schools in MCPS. I respectfully ask you to take the time to see us. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Jennifer Jones. Dr. Jennifer Jones. Do I press anything? Nope, you're no. good. Okay. Hello, Dr. McKnight and Board of Education members. Welcome Arvin Kim, Grace Rivera Oven from Up County, like me. Even though she went to my rival high school, and Julie Yang, who I was happy to promote for MCEA's endorsement. I'm Gen Dr. Jennifer Jones, 42-year resident, MCPS graduate, Seneca Valley, and 31-year employee with 24 years as an elementary school counselor. This is my 12th year in a row speaking to you to ask for more mental health supports for our elementary students. Why am I here again this year? Well, Dr. McKnight's budget for FY24 states it will provide for the mental health and well-being of students. Every year, several of us elementary counselors testify about the urgency for more mental health supports and a critical need for a much lower elementary school counselor ratio. Unfortunately, as stated in the budget, we are facing a funding cliff we must be ready to address because this will be the last full fiscal year that this relief funding is available. As some of you know, two summers ago, I was part of a group of elementary counselors who met with the Board of Education members in separate meetings, including Pat O'Neill, Rebecca Smondrowski, Lynn Harris, and Brenda Wolf, regarding issues facing elementary counselors. Sustainability of funding was one of the topics. Attached to my testimony that you will receive, please read that letter sent to Dr. McKnight and all those board members in 2021 that gave background for the meetings we had with them. Dr. McKnight replied that she would share it with her team as they planned moving forward. Then in fall 2021, Dr. Karen Cruz presented to the Special Populations Committee requesting more counselor positions. And thanks to federal funding, 44 half-time elementary counselor positions were rolled out in three phases that school year. As elementary counselors were thrilled to have an additional staffing, hoped for much more because half of our 135 elementary schools still only have one full-time counselor. Unfortunately, based on this budget proposal, there is no change in the elementary school counselor staffing formula to move closer to that 1 to 250 ratio that all middle and high schools have enjoyed for years. The 1 to 250 ratio for the all K-12 schools is supported by research attached to my testimony and recommended by the American School Counselor Association, whose model MCPS is supposed to follow. In Appendix C, Elementary counselor ratios are one per school, an additional half per school if you're non-focused and you're more than 700, if you are focused with more than 600, or Title I with between 510 and 650, an additional full-time if you're Title I and over 650. Middle school and high school counselor ratios are at all schools, one to 250. Hmm. We need you to add more elementary counselor positions to this budget. I'm happy to help you write budget amendments, as I did with Janet De Jeanette Dixon for this purpose a few years ago, successfully. Please read the rest of my testimony. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Up next, we'll hear from Christina Jenkins. Good evening, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is Christina Jenkins, and I am the proud school counselor at Woodfield Elementary. This is my 11th year as a school counselor and 24th year with MCPS. 
Prior to becoming a school counselor, I was a classroom teacher, and I'm here to speak with you about how MCPS interprets the Maryland Blueprint and how, as a school counselor, I was denied the maximum supplement stipend despite my national board certification status. According to MCPS, the position I currently hold of school counselor does not qualify for the $10,000 compensation increase under the Blueprint criteria and the Maryland State Department of Education definitions because I am not considered an educator that is a teacher of record or co-teacher teaching a minimum average of 60% of their working time. I'm here to share how I interpret my amazing job. Every role I have at Woodfield has a direct impact on student achievement. Teaching is definitely one of my roles as it is part of my everyday. As a school counselor, the only one assigned at Woodfield, I teach on a biweekly schedule to our pre-K all the way up to fifth grades and our autism classes. I have direct access to every single student in my building. In fact, I can proudly share that I am assigned as a co-teacher in the health, sub health subject now in Synergy because these are my students too. I teach a variety of class classroom lessons, but I also provide small group instruction and interventions to focus on more intense student needs, including topics such as emotional regulation, social skills, adjusting to family changes, and learning and academic success skills. Building our students' capacity by addressing these skills in an intervention style helps them to be more available for learning and able to make academic progress. The national board process became intriguing to me as it is described as one of the most prestigious and respected professional certifications available in education. I consider myself an accomplished educator as a national board certified teacher. Did you know the national board certification process I completed and achieved is the same process as a classroom teacher? I completed four components and demonstrated advanced knowledge, skills, and practice in the area of school counseling. Dr. McKnight and MCPS has repeatedly put social emotional learning and well-being at the top of our priorities for at least the last two years. The board's strategic plan has been aligned with supporting health and social emotional well-being. Every move throughout my workday is directly aligned with ensuring the well-being of our students, staff, and families. However, out of 30 eligible job codes for the National Board Salary Supplement, school counselors are left off of this. This is a disconnect. In addition, MC, MSDE shared specific insight for school counselors in the April 2022 memo, and I have met that criteria. So I ask you to review this decision, please, and Maryland Blueprint again, and recognize the work that counselors do. At the very least, have a counselor voice there at the table when these decisions are made and when others are interpreting our job description. Thank, Thank you. you. Up next, we'll hear from Emmett Tesler. You're on. Good evening. My name is Emmett Tesler, and I teach first grade at Roscoe Nix. This is my third year teaching. My biggest concern as a teacher is funding, or lack thereof. My budget for my classroom materials was not enough to cover my actual needs. So a lot of my needed day-to-day -day materials come from my own personal funds. Often I need to buy more than what I need for my students because when classes are split for coverage, I must use additional supplies for my students, from, for the students from other classes. Since it's different teachers with different students, I can't always reuse these same materials. Each year I have needed to invest at least $1,000 into my classroom in addition to the funds I got from the county. That's just to cover the basics. Not including when I want to provide more meaningful, hands-on experiences. Because of spending in my classroom, I haven't been able to build personal savings, plan a trip, or take quality time with myself and my friends. I've missed out on experiences because I use personal funds for my students. This shouldn't be the normal. Well, this shouldn't be normal, but it is with many teachers. Compounded by my student loan payments, I'm financially prevented from doing anything beyond the basics. I can't afford professional development opportunities. My staff development teacher forwards us information, often from within the county, to lots of interesting workshops and conferences. There was one about whole brain trauma informed instruction at a conference that cost it $450. 
and I would have tremendously benefited my teaching practice. I couldn't afford it, so I didn't engage in the opportunity. Even if I had been able to afford the conference, I may not have been approved to go. If sub coverage, if sub -coverage wasn't found, I would not have been able to attend. We have suffered from a substitute shortage for too long. Every day since mid-November, our professional staff are required to provide coverage. There is not enough incentives to fill substitute positions. Openings three months in advance are left empty. It hurts teachers and students. MCPS must incentivize substitute teaching jobs and increase its wages for its substitutes. I call on MCPS to increase the budget and put money directly into the teacher's hands to use where we know it is needed. I've I know I have looked beyond MCPS, particularly at other counties for higher base salary. I know many other teachers have too. We must fully fund our schools because children deserve access to the best and teachers deserve the chance to live a life with meaningful experiences. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Tremaine Wooten. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Tremaine Wooten. I've been educated for 10 years, five of those in Montgomery County. I currently teach government, modern world history, and African-American history elective at Wheaton High School. I also happen to referee basketball for MCPS. I just came from that tonight. Like teachers across public schools, I deal with lack of planning, PL planning time, PLC and IEP meetings make time management even more difficult. Furthermore, substitute and staff shortages force teachers to cover for others, taking away whatever plan of time is left. In many of our schools, our work sites need investment in infrastructure. Despite Wheaton High School being relatively new, it has recently had HVAC issues back in December, with some classrooms feeling unbearably hot and some too cold to use. Our football field needs to be fixed, among other issues, as it has a draining issue. But what I really want to talk about to you today is what it means to be African American teacher in Montgomery County. Many African Americans in the county have been displaced due to soaring prices of rent and property. I personally was priced out of the county. I live in Prince George's County and drive almost 30 minutes to work in a community where I can't afford to live. I want to live and work in the county, but I like many other minority families have to work two or three jobs or side hustles. We know that children need to see people like themselves reflect, reflected positively in the world around them. We know that students thrive when they have teachers who look like themselves. But what are we doing to ensure that MCPS faculty is as diverse as our majority students of color in the school system that I'm hearing from all around the county? And recently, a high school student told me that I was the first black male teacher they ever had. That is shameful. MCPS should be doing everything it can to recruit and retain diverse educators. I hear potential black recruits are choosing higher paying jobs rather than struggling to live here while teaching our kids. Competitive salaries are needed to ensure diverse recruitment. My parents once discouraged me originally because the pay was not good, encouraging me to pick a higher paying field, but I chose to do what I loved. This often happens in communities of color. Our children are discouraged for higher paying jobs. If we don't improve salaries across the board, we are creating an even deeper diversity gap in education. I urge MCPS to put your money where your mouth is and to create a truly diverse, equitable, and flourishing school community for all. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Orchid Gargahi. You may begin. Hi everyone, my name is Orkid Dargahi and I teach at Sligo Middle School. I've been an educator for seven years. I support emergent multilingual learners and students with academic disabilities as a co-teacher in social studies and I teach Spanish. I do not have my own classroom. I was told the space doesn't exist in our building. In November of 2022, I was finally given a three foot by three foot table with no storage in a shared team room. My neighbor is the copy machine. I spend 30 minutes a day transitioning to different spaces seven times a day, 30 minutes that force me to choose planning lessons over using the bathroom. But enough about me. MCPS has an increasing refugee population from Afghanistan. 
Because there are no support staff in my building to help these families, I've had to sacrifice instructional time and professional development time, as well as parent-teacher conferences, to translate Farsi to English so that, and, and vice versa, English to Farsi, so that I can be there for our students and for their families. If you're wondering, yes, I teach Spanish. My family is Persian. Um, I'm doing this for these families so that they know where their kids can catch the bus, uh, what immunization records they need to bring to school, just basic information. As is so often the case, our most vulnerable students get hit hardest by systemic failures. Students just learning the English alphabet are walking one and a half miles to school because they don't have a bus route. They navigate, they navigate excuse me, Georgia Avenue during rush hour um, at the budget meeting several weeks ago, Dr. McKnight, you mentioned MCPS has the largest green bus fleet. I respectfully urge you to match that energy to get our most vulnerable kids to school safely because I think we can do better than that. These same families have little recourse for virtual school days during inclement weather, which all members of the board, except Mr. Kim, our student member, voted to approve just last week. We need skilled in-person interpreters in the name of continuity of learning. Technology decisions about massive MCPS investments canceled out years of educator work and planning because Active Inspire, which is what we used to use, many of us used for our lessons, are not compatible with the new box light smart boards. Your panel of experts about these decisions must include educators themselves. Educators are spread thin and doubling and tripling as last resort recourse I'm sorry, last resort resources, because kids are falling through the cracks. We can resolve this by hiring more teachers, reducing class sizes, relieving the burden of overworked and burnt out educators. If you want to retain experienced profession, professionals and recruit fresh new talent, improve educator salaries to reflect the respect that we have earned and deserve. Our growing population of emergent multilingual students deserve access to high quality education. I urge you to listen to the people on the ground who are also the experts to ensure our most vulnerable students glow and shine instead of being treated as invisible because of systemic shortfalls in our county. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Tina Allen. Tina Allen. Okay, let's continue with Win uh, Win or Nuyen Nuyen. Good evening, member of the Board of Education and Superintendent Dr. McKnight. My name is Dr. Win Win. Usually I testify for the uh, County Councils for the Asian American Community, but I'm here today as an MCPS parent, and I'm advocate for my son, and also for operating budget fund, especially for adequate responses and resource for support of students of special needs. I would like you to picture a six-year-old child standing alone outside the building without his coat at the 30 degree weather. He was crying, asking for his mom, so scared and wet his pain because someone left him, forgot that he was not in his classroom. And that child was my son. It happened in March 2022. My son attended the learning center at Brook Gross Elementary School. And that was not the only incident. Between March to October 2022, the child let my son wander without adult supervision for three times. Two of the three times, my son was picked up by bystander, and thanks God, he was safe. I'm still shaking while I'm talking. Letting a child stray unsupervised three times is unacceptable. It reflects the school system failure for safety to protect our most vulnerable members. And I forgot to mention my child was diagnosed with autism at the age, since the age of two. And that's those students and those children that special need, they need our help. When the third incident happened, I contacted the superintendent office and asked him for help numerous times. I was promised that someone would contact me. Until earlier today, I was not heard from the superintendent office. And fortunately, through effort, with the help of Ms. Evans and 
the ombudsman, I was get contact by the special education educators and the school supervisor who helped me in the past few months. And since October 2022, I have out my family. We exhausted all of our effort to seek help from MCPS official to protect my child from danger. My testimony today is not only about my son, but a larger issue of equity and safety for all MCPS students, especially students with special needs. I urge you to consider funding in this area. Three areas for you to consider. Number one, conduct evaluation of a reported case that involves special needs students. How many cases were in school that never been elevated? We need to know that. Number two, engage with family of special needs children, especially the under-resourced community, to ensure that they have the access and be able to bring up their concern. Number three, establish the hotline. I know you have the hotline, but be sure that they are account have accountability, accountability you, and get back to the parent within the lot of time. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Lisa Clark and Robin Hatchell Hart. Okay, Melissa Reagan. Good evening, Board of Ed and Superintendent McKnight. I'm Melissa Regan, alumni, band, and visual arts magnet parent. My testimony today is to elevate that fine arts are disproportionately underfunded and our budget is currently at 25% of need. Let's take a look at in instrumental music as an example. Central purchases are significantly underfunded. Elementary schools share about 135,000 total and middle and high schools receive zero dedicated funds specifically to purchase instruments and have to use local school allocations that are meant for all kinds of school expenses. The current amount needed annually to purchase instruments is 250,000. Can this amount be added to the supplies and materials line item and include secondary schools? Repairs of broken instruments are significantly underfunded. Total repair allocation for FY23 is about 80,000. Elementary schools share about 14, middle and high are combined and share about 66. Our frequently used instruments get worn out and break. We have not been able to keep up with repairs needed and have a backlog of 32,000 waiting. The current amount needed annually for, for repairs is 300,000. Can this amount be added to a line item as well? The nuts and bolts are really significantly underfunded. Elementary schools are required to provide a minimum per pupil amount for instruction. Middle and high schools do not. It's at principal's discretion to cover instructional materials, music license rights, and stands. There's an average base amount of $1,700 per school for transportation, shared with chorus, which is roughly half of what's necessary. 370,000 is what's really needed to provide transportation to county adjudications and to purchase the music licensing for performances. Could transportation be centralized, similar to the equity measure employed recently by athletics? Another note about equity. Certain school communities have parents that easily purchase a personal instrument or cover the cost of a repair. Successful fundraisers are held that lead to more opportunities and choice of music. And core classes are not offered equitably and vary greatly across the county school to school. Fully funding fine arts ensures that all students have access. Besides instrumental music, theater, general music, art, chorus, and dance are also woefully underfunded and understaffed in the same manner. To supervise these six content areas, over 200 courses, and 50 plus community partnerships, we have a supervisor, one coordinator who covers instrumental and drama, would we have a coordinator that covers both math and social studies, and one coordinator for chorus and general music. There is a teacher specialist responsible for visual art and dance, however, dance is really just left out, and MCPS is actually out of compliance. Fine Arts needs one additional FTE to meet the Thank needs you. of 124,000 students enrolled. Thank you. Up next, we'll hear from Julia Rogers. Julia Rogers, no. Yolanda Ferber. Just... 
Good evening, esteemed members of the Board of Education and Dr. McKnight. My name is Yolanda Stefano Ferber. I am the school counselor at Westbrook Elementary School in Bethesda. Prior to that, I was the school counselor for 13 years at Thurgood Marshall in, in Gaithersburg. I was born and raised in Montgomery County. I actually attended Blair High School's kindergarten program in 1970, so that dates me for you. Graduated from Churchill High School, and my kids are also all MCPS graduates and doing very, very well. I have never testified here before, but I felt compelled to come and speak today because of my very deep concern for the youngest and most vulnerable members of our society, our children. I actually lay awake at night worrying about these children. In preparing for today, I reflected on my own preparation each year as I begin a new school year. What are my goals going to be? What might my students' goals be? How about their parents? What are their goals for their children? And as I contemplate these questions, I look to you today and ask you the same introspective question. What are your goals for your stewards, the children of our school system? I would hope that most of you would include your, in your long-term goal that our students grow up to be prepared for what lies beyond high school, whether it's college, career, or both. That is what we are tasked to do prepare these precious children for what comes next. Right now, in my opinion, from a mental health perspective, we are not doing that. As counselors, we see it all. Children come to us hungry, confused, scared, having little to no understanding of the English language, or alternatively, ready to learn, emotionally intelligent, well-fed, reading fourth grade text in kindergarten, and so, and so on. We meet them where they are, and we provide tools necessary for them to be, be and feel very successful. In order to do this, we need to be proactive. We need to be able to anticipate issues, plan for them, prepare whole class, group, individual lessons that address each student's and class's individual needs. We also work on developing professional development for our staff. I know you've heard many times before, and you're going to keep hearing about how elementary counselors cast a very wide net. I have attached a copy of my testimony of what a typical counselor schedule looks like in elementary. In addition to this, I'm on core team, ILT, well-being team, SIP committees, you name it. I provide all kinds of professional development. What, the, what I'm here for you to talk to you about today is because when I started in 2019 at Westbrook, we had under 300 students. I was able to implement several programs that promoted an anti-racist, anti-bias, inclusion, and leadership program. I trained students to be peer mediators so they can help resolve conflicts. I started the No Place for Hate program. I helped our core team develop school-wide expectations. All of this I was able to do because I had the time and the resources. Now we are at almost 500 students. There's no way I could do that right now. We're at 500 because we had a redistricting with Somerset students coming over. So I'm imploring you to consider lowering the ratio of elementary counselors to students to something that is like secondary, one to 250. I'm the only counselor with 496 students. If we we want to further MCPS's mission of preparing our students mentally and emotionally for the challenges they face. I need your support so that every student can learn and be successful. Thank, Thank you, you for your time and consideration today. Up next, we'll hear from Chelsea Cohen. Good evening. My name is Chelsea Cohen. I'm an MCPS speech language pathologist. I hold a master's degree, Maryland State Licensure through the Department of Health, and National Certification of Clinical Competence from the American Speech Language Hearing Association. I am the kind of highly qualified professional that the blueprint for Maryland's future law envisions and MCPS special education <coughs> students deserve access to, but may not receive due to critical shortages in school-based speech language pathologists. I am here today to implore the board to fund the expansion of the blueprint for Maryland's future career ladder to be accessible to all nationally certificated employees, not just teachers of record. The situation for related services professionals is dire in MCPS this year, and as a result, our 20,000 special education students may be detrimentally underserved. Due to a high percentage of vacancies, speech language pathologists, school psychologists, occupational and physical therapists, social workers, and other certified professionals have had to take on additional students and schools, exponentially increasing their caseloads. This results in the delivery of substandard services that are not individualized to meet each student's unique needs. Both our new and veteran educators become demoralized by delivering services that are lower in quality and burned out from, the, from trying to manage an impossibly high caseload. Many are leaving for other school districts, private practice, or hospital settings. Some MCPS vacancies have been filled by contractors who are unfamiliar with both our district and our students, resulting in legal and ethical breaches. 
In other cases, students must receive their assessments or services virtually from remote therapists in other states because MCPS was not able to recruit to provide these services in person. In fact, the 2022 extended school year was the first year in MCPS history during which many students were denied the required speech language therapy th services due to therapist vacancies. MCPS must invest in incentives that will attract and retain diverse and highly qualified related services professionals. The blueprint for Maryland's future was passed with the goal of raising the status of the teaching profession, along with encouraging our most experienced classroom teachers to remain in the classroom. But the legislation fell short in its exclusion of other educational professionals who work with students each and every day. Equitable access to career ladders and pay parity would relay the message that high achieving educators of all kinds are indispensable components of a successful and accomplished public school system. You must act on behalf of our special education students, one of our most vulnerable populations. They count on your advocacy and support and we call on you to do what's right by them so that they can receive the quality services that they need and deserve in order to thrive from the most knowledgeable and accomplished professionals our county has to offer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. <clears throat> Up next, we'll hear from our final speaker, Melissa Lichter and Constance Kinder, or Kinder. Melissa and Constance? No? Okay. Okay, then I will um, look to my colleagues to see if you have any questions or final comments. Please turn on your light if you wish to speak. Ms. Evans? Sure, so once again, I wanna thank everyone for coming out. Hope I'm loud enough. Um, and I did wanna state that um, the safety and security of all of our students is of utmost importance, not only to my colleagues, but, uh, but to our superintendent. And so I will say to um, Dr. Wynn, um, we are um, definitely very sorry that those incidents happened, um, but I do know that you were able to be in contact with Mr. Fitzpatrick and the board staff uh, in the board office, um, as well as work with um, people in your building. And I appreciate Dr. Murphy and um, Mr. Stockton and Mr. Gersey making certain that um, we speak with you. So we just wanna make certain that um, going forward, everything is safe and secure for your son. I just wanted to state that. Um, Mr. Wooten is no longer here. I wanted to, let him know that um, we appreciate him being a male educator of color, and I wanted to inform him of the Bond Project that's building our network of diversity. Those are male educators here in the Montgomery County Public School System that just get together and talk and support one another, and they are always trying to ensure that, um, in addition to staff and senior leadership that they feel supported here in our school system. And then um, Ms. Uh, Regan, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, um, thank you for your testimony. So if I remember, or if I can recall correctly, you were here in 2020, and that was prior to the pandemic in regards to instrumental um, music and what we would do around better supporting and being equitable here in our school system. At the time, the superintendent was Dr. Smith, and he talked about um, we did not have a specific budget allotted to instrumental music, but that we were gonna look into that and do that, and then the pandemic came, like right, like literally like two months later, so we weren't able to do that. So we'll ask staff to kind of look back into that, because based on your testimony and testimony that we heard from others, there were some inequities um, around our students being able to play the instruments that they were interested in playing, and then in each of the schools being able to have the funding, um, it not being equitable because some of the funding would go towards repairing instruments because they were old, right? And so we did have a really good, great discussion on that. And so I'll just try to pull up what was specifically said and share it with um, staff now. But thank you for your repeated testimony. And so we hear you. Thank you. Mr. Vetta Oven. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much. I um, just, just, uh, couple of clarifications and some new. Um, folks spoke about the Equity Innovation Fund and how that no longer is but was. 
And I'm wondering if that fund would have been used by um, Ms. Tesler, who testified that she had to use a lot of her own funding to get stuff for her classroom. So I just, for, for those, oh, maybe just for me, um, you just to have a little bit of clarity on that, um, because I know this is not unique to her. I think this is, you know, almost the norm for many teachers. Um, and, and it's an equity issue, right? Um, uh, and, and a big one, and we know with the pandemic that just made things worse. Um, and then I just need a little bit of clarity with the counselors about, uh, and, and I don't, you know, the, the blueprint is new, so we're still learning a lot of the stuff, so I don't know where the guidelines are, but it would be good to have some clarity uh, later, not, not tonight from the staff, about where that lines up with the counselors um, and those who have the certificate of teaching and how that can be applied. And then with Ms. Orchid, I think she already left, right? Um, her testimony was very moving to me um, uh, because uh, it must be really difficult to teach under those conditions. I just, can we do something maybe to help her find a room where she can have her stuff and, uh, um, and be able to, it sounds like she, she's going over the call of duty. Um, as somebody you know who, who worked in the system for many years and who was one of the few Spanish speaking, and, and Ms. Sylvester can probably relate to this, right? Um, people come to you. You know, it's not part of your job, it's not part of your duties, but it's, 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 it's a human thing, right? That you just cannot say sometimes no because it is part of being a caretaker and a giver. It's part of our profession. It's part of our vocation. That's where we're, we go the extra mile. So I just want us to see if we can, uh, it, we can look into that um, as well. And, and maybe for a discussion on folks who are those folks who speak that, that language that is so hard to, to do, if there's a stipend or something that we can do to recognize um, that skill, because it is a skill when you, when you do translation or when you do interpretation. Um, and to look with, uh, you know, within. Um, and lastly, I just want to say, Dr. Gui, in my heart, just, just broke. Um, and I think for all of us, right? We're all, we're all humans, and, and, and to think of your little boy out there, it just, um, so it's, um, I'm sure Dr. Magnai is, you know, is on it. And uh, of course, this is a priority for every child, especially you know those who are the most vulnerable, um, and in communities that usually don't get to come like you to testify in an evening, take time from work, right? And um, so you're speaking not just for yourself, but you're speaking for many for many others. Um, and just want to say to all of you, because I know many of you are moms, and you're here you know late at night, but um, speech therapists, um, I had one for a few years in elementary school and middle school and worked really hard at, you know, with me and, and, um, and really left an impact. She was not just my therapist, but she was also a friend and an ally. Um, and, and that's what you guys are. So please don't feel discouraged. It's, we're going through some rough times. It's just not a lot of people to fill a lot of these positions. And um, that's just part of the reality that we are living in, but um, thank you all for, for coming tonight and for testifying. I just wanted to thank everyone for coming tonight also. I know every year we hear from our school psychologists, we hear from our school counselors. We understand that more are needed and we are constantly trying to add to that number. I also want to say to Dr. Nguyen, New my heart also broke. I, Almost, I fell out when I heard what you said. Um, I can't imagine being a parent and, and finding out that my child was outside, especially a small child that has a learning challenge. So I just want you to know that I'm sure that we're taking all precautions to try to rectify these situations and ensure that they don't happen. That's not to say that they won't happen again. Hopefully you won't experience this again but we are trying to put things in place to ensure that these situations are rectified. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Abrina, I wanted to ask if you can speak to the blueprint equity issue mm -hmm. and what we are hoping 
to do about it? Absolutely. So um, thank you for coming tonight and sharing your advocacy around the blueprint. And I do believe this is something that we should cover in our next blueprint presentation, which is coming up. So as you know, the uh, blueprint is funded in many ways by the state. So the goal is that all of the things that the state requires that the school systems implement as a required to the blueprint, the funding is coming from them. Um, in this area of teacher, um, national board certified teachers, and I must say Montgomery County leads and is blasting everybody else out in terms of the number of teachers that we have, um, the state defined what would qualify for uh, staff being able to get that stipend. And it does state that a teacher has to teach a certain number of classes or have a number of certain of students assigned to them in terms of how they define it to receive funding from the state. So that is, that is a challenge. I mean, we all know that we depend on many positions to support our students. It's never just the classroom teacher. We learned that during the pandemic. We depend on our bus drivers. We depend on our counselors. We depend on everyone to be able to meet the needs of students. Um, but that is how the state funded or defined that in Blueprint to be able to provide the funding to the LEAs. So, um, of course, if MCPS ever went beyond that, that would have to come from local funding. Ms. Yang? Ms. Harris was first. Okay, um, thank you everyone uh, for coming out and as I sit here, like most of you have stated that you have shared this year after year after year. And I once worked in an elementary school with one counselor and I know the workload and I have heard stories of sometimes how Things just can't fit in a day's schedule, and then some of the things have to be let go. And just now, someone was saying, I think it was one of the cluster coordinators say, 8% may be what we define as a bold ask. But as a school system, we have so much need. Maybe that's not so bold in terms of our need. So I just want to say that we hear you and we hope that we will be able to meet the needs, if not this year, um, future years, but this is something that we are committed to work on. Thank you for your sacrifices and your dedication to our students. Ms. Harris? Yeah, um, I just, um, I really do appreciate um, the, this, the stories that people are, are sharing with us because you know we're a system of over 160,000 students and their families and 25,000 plus employees which means every single day that the schools are open there are hundreds of thousands of experiences happening and we don't know what we don't know and so when you help us to see some of the things that we could be missing and it, it helps us to shine a light on the work that we're trying to do sitting here um, and I think that, you know, just because the blueprint is the way it is now doesn't mean that's the way it has to stay. So when you're highlighting for us gaps in, in um, professional career ladders for m many of the professionals that are mission critical to serving our students well, then we have the opportunity to elevate those concerns and advocate for those changes and work with our state delegation um, on bills that would expand that career ladder to truly embrace all of the professionals that um, make sure we do the best job we can making each one of our students college career and community ready. So um, I hadn't, I mean, I, I really do appreciate you shining that light and, and, and painting the picture in the way that you've done um, because I think it does help us create a narrative that we can take for take forward and in, in a very cogent very substantive way um, so um, and the one thing that I did want to mention and, and Ms. Daragi Daragi uh, left you said but the the issue of the bus route getting to Sligo Middle School for students that have to cross Georgia Avenue um, I I thought we had 
looked at that earlier. Maybe I'm misremembering, but um, that's you know to me that is a hazard. That's that's definitely a hazard bus route. We have far shorter trips to school, and I know the the um, the the walk walkability area for schools um, is gradated based on level. So ES is different than middle, which is different from high. But when we have those those high hazard roadways, um, if to, that seems to you know hazard busing is something that we do do, mm -hmm. um, and if we especially if we're looking at a high uh, number of um, newcomers to our community and families who are still trying to navigate many 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 aspects of life here, if we could actually look at that and see if there's a way that we can provide transportation across that hazardous roadway. Um, for those population of students. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, that concludes our hearing for tonight. Uh, please uh, thank you for coming once again. Drive safely and be well.